Rittberg ions, uh, Rittberg atoms schemes and uh, trapped ion schemes. So basically, to, to use the really good quantum control of trapped ions and a strong Rittberg interaction for entanglement operations. So why is it interesting? Basically, because Rittberg atoms and ions have really, really special properties. Uh, so uh, the electron wave function, of course, gets really, really big. For instance, if you have here the the five atom half ground state wave function of strontium, then this is something like 0.4 nanometers, which is basically compared to the size of the Earth and the Sun, uh, that's basically the relationship between n equal to 30 principal quantum number to five okay. So 30s is of course not really a high Rittberg state. In principle, you want to eat a And uh, since the radius of this uh, uh, electron wave function scale is n to the power 2, it gets bigger. Due to that, it also gets very special properties. For instance, lifetime scales is n to the power 3, and the porosability is n to the power 7. So it's really, really strongly porosable, basically because, of course, the core and the electron wave function, they can be actually quite a bit displaced as soon as the, as the electron is actually far away. OK, of course, on the other hand side, you want to put such a system now in an ion trap. And uh, the main problem there is, of course, you want to traffic with electric fields. And usually, rhythmic atoms are extremely sensitive to electric fields. And you might think, is that really a good idea? Because uh, the electric fields get really, really strong. But if you look a little closer, of course, you're trapping the ion usually at the center of this quadruple pool potential, which is basically a position where the electric field is zero. Uh, so if you do proper micromotion compensation, you're really properly here in the center, and then even oscillating electric field should be zero, just you have a quadruple field. Of course, the electron wave function is quite big, and it might actually sample part of this quadruple field, and you do that might be extra. OK, so of course, if you want to excite ions into Rydberg state, as Igor already pointed out, you need to excite them to an energy level that's quite high up, up in, in energy. So if you go through a different uh, uh, species that are standardly used for ion trapping, then you see that uh, if you want to excite it with a single photon transition, you need on the order of 100 nanometers for exciting into Rydberg state. So this is, of course, not an easy laser to, to build and to use. But uh, there was this heroic experiment in Mainz that uh, actually used a laser at 123 nanometers for exciting ions into Rydberg states, in that case, calcium ions. And uh, they were the first ones to excite ions in an ion trap into Rydberg states. We wanted to go a little bit different direction because we don't have such a laser around. And of course, it's not easy to build one. So what we wanted to, to do, or what we plan to do, is uh, to use a two-photon excitation starting from this metastable D state in strontium-88, and uh, then use a 243 nanometer laser to excite first to 63 plus, and then from there with another tunable laser between the 4 to 3 and 9 nanometers to a uh, principal quantum number and 30 to infinity, basically, of NS or MD states. Uh, and NS or MD states. So that's the, the transition the, the transition set of that will allow, of course. That's what is easy to try. From the Rydberg state or from the intermediate state, of course, you will have uh, spontaneous emission. And if you calculate the transition rates, actually, you will figure out that uh, approximately 95% of the population ends up in the S state in the end. So basically, what that means, if you start in D state, you excite it to Rydberg state, and then you wait for some time, you will end up in a positive state. And by that, you can also easily detect the ripple excitation by just doing fluorescence detection here, driving this transition here from S to q halves. And if it's fluorescing, then you know there was something excited in between. So it's not fluorescing, nothing else. OK. So one of the two lasers that we're using for two the 243 nanometer laser is the frequency quadruple. Uh, laser, dial laser from 970 to 243. It's a commercial system. We get, in the end, 30 milliwatts. Is, we still need to push it a little bit. If you push it really hard, it's probably 100 milliwatt. But uh, then it will actually decay within a couple of hours to half an hour. Okay, so it's not really stable. Of course, there's now lasers that are more stable than that. 
more of the commercial lasers, or you can look at the literature. Actually, there's sources available that go up to a lot or something like that. Okay, so the second excitation step was this tunable laser, 305 to 309 nanometers, and we actually modified the standard beryllium ion with a beryllium laser system for some frequency generation of a, a, a telecom and something that's almost telecom laser uh, to reach something like 610 to 620, and then down here to here. So in the end, we get, well, 75 milliwatts is probably quite conservative, so we can get up to 100 milliwatts. And it's really nicely stable, so that's nice. Uh, what we do then is uh, a ripper excitation by these two lasers, and we shine them from opposite directions. Basically, the reason for that is that we want to be in an effective lamp ticker regime. And of course, if you get two momentum kicks, kicks from opposite direction, you basically almost not have any momentum kick. And that means uh, you are nicely into the lamp ticker regime with a ripper excitation, and you don't get any more momentum to double it. Okay, if we do that, and first, just the first step, you see nicely the resonance when we uh, transfer populate from the initial state to the 5S state, just going while into the third state. The value fits more or less nicely with the theory value that we had before. And uh, yes, that all fits nicely. If you want to also to send in a second laser, what happens is that the two upper levels also get coupled, and you've got an auto count effect. And basically, by the auto count effect, you can Measure the Rabi frequency of the Okay, if you then have the outer count effect, it's quite natural also to use coherent, uh, do some type of coherent excitation. And what we did is uh, a stimulated Raman Ali passage. So we started at initial state. We first switched on the upper coupling and then slowly the lower coupling. And by that, the, the counterintuitive pulse sequence, what we do is we transfer the population from the initial state to the required state adiabatically uh, via this almost dark state. Because, of course, it's not a real dark state because the final state is So you have uh, the coupling here follows adiabatically that state, and from initial and zero state, which is true. We can do that now, and of course, if we transfer population into Rydberg state, we see actually that almost no population is left in the initial state, because when we then wait for some time, of course, it decays to the initial state. Some population might come back, but most of the population decays to the state. If we then uh, want to know what is really in the Rydberg state, what we then do is we transfer population up, and after some time, we transfer population down again, and if we do that, then we can bring something like 60% population back down, which means uh, something like 80% is for signal transfer. Uh, we can also do that with a delay time, and by that we can basically measure the light on the Rydberg state. In that case, it was something like 2.3 microseconds. Theory value would be something like 3.5 microseconds, uh, which is basically uh, the, the natural lifetime plus black body radiation, so including black. So these stir up pulses are short compared to a microsecond? They are uh, short compared to a microsecond. They are on the order of, well, in that case, I think it was uh, yeah, a few, few hundred nanoseconds. Okay. So of course, you need quite a bit of power, run frequency to drive that pulse. So that is really not a transfer. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's also none of that. So uh, we, of course, pushed it a little bit more, and then in the end we reached the double transfer of something like 80%, single transfer of around 90%. So that's, that was almost possible at that time. We think most of the infidelity in that case was actually due to laser line width. At that point of time, we had uh, a laser line width of uh, maybe something like 100 kilohertz of both of these lasers, and that was basically limiting the adiabatic so uh, from lifetime limitation, we would have expected something like that. OK, now we want to have uh, interaction between these ions, Rydberg ions. And uh, the problem that we have with Rydberg ions is that the core is actually doubly charged. And due to that, the electron wave function is closer to the core. And that means the Van der Waals interaction also gets smaller. 
And it actually scales as set the core charge in our case to a set to the power of minus six. Which means in grid break lines, what you would usually have are a few megahertz of interaction with grid break atoms. Here it's actually a few tens of kilohertz. And to, to compared to the lifetime of these grid break states of a few microseconds, it's just a So due to that, what we need to do is we need to actually induce dipoles and then really go to a dipole dipole. <coughs> What we do is we try now transitions between NS states and NT states uh, to generate dress states, NS and NT dressed. And these dress states have actually an oscillating type of So I will explain that a little bit more in, in a minute. And what you then have is, of course, a resonant basis is a dipole dipole interaction between two such oscillating dipoles next to each other. And that is strong enough, can go into an error. Frequency that we need to drive this transition for 46S is 120 gigahertz. It's quite strong, quite quite high frequency, but uh, there's also a limit. So what we use as a source is a frequency multiplied microwave source. And the nice thing about that is that's really stable in frequency and also stable in power. Uh, well, we still have a little bit of fluctuations in power that hurts us <coughs> at the moment, but we we will work. So what we have is just a horn here that emits this microwave radiation at 120 gigahertz, and then we focus it by normal gold mirrors into the ion trap, and uh, then going through the vacuum, you know, like a normal laser, you would just focus it. Uh, of course, you have to consider 120 gigahertz is actually a wavelength of a few millimeters, okay, or centimeter, uh, which means you have to fit this microwave in, the, in the, the slit in between these plates. And of course, this will attenuate also the microwave by some amount. But uh, we get, I think, something like 95% uh, of, the, of the power in the end at the line. All of the rest is probably losses on, on the window or losses due to this plate that we can really reach. But I mean, 5% is much too much from uh, something like a millibus that you had initially you get, can drive this transition with up to zero. So we had to actually attenuate first the microwave power quite a lot to be able to work. So what is these oscillating dipole moments? Uh, if you now drive this transition S to P, and you go to dress states, but not in a non-rotating frame, what you have is an S orbital plus E to the I omega T, P orbital. And of course, what happens then is that sometimes you have this S orbital plus P orbital, sometimes you have S orbital minus P orbital. Which means sometimes they add up above and subtract below, and sometimes in the opposite direction. So the electron wave function, electron is actually oscillating around the core, and what you get is such an oscillating. <coughs> okay. Um, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated. You, of course, drive here a sigma transition. Due to that, you actually get rather a rotating dipole instead of linear dipole oscillating. And uh, what we then do is, of course, we put two of such ions next to each other in the microwave in the ion trap, apply this microwave field perpendicular to the, to the uh, conversation axis, and then you get rotating dipoles that are actually rotating around the conversation axis. OK. Now, uh, if we go to these dress states, you have this microwave coupling, excited by two photon excitation. And then we can actually probe these stress states up here, the microwave coupled stress states, by two photon <coughs> transitions. And what we see here is again an outer town splitting of these microwave stress states. We have the plus state and the minus state of this S plus P and S minus P. And uh, the interaction, of course, is strongest when you really have a symmetric S and P superposition. Which means here the interaction, if you want to go, have the maximum interaction, you would go on resonance. Um, of course, now if you have interaction, what you would get is a uh, uh, dipole dipole interaction or a Rydberg energy shift if both of these ions next to each other are excited. And you would expect something like a Rydberg blockade due to this energy shift. So one ion can get excited to Rydberg state, to the stress state. The second ion is shifted in energy and cannot be excited. In <coughs> okay, that's what we try now to prove that we can do that. Uh, we excite two ions next to each other to the Rydberg state. The green line is actually the curve of an only a single line excited to the Rydberg state. And what we first do is we don't apply any microwave press. So no microwave at all. 
So there's no interaction. Only from the bars, which is too weak, actually. What we can see is this is a single ion case, this is two ion case, and uh, the red curve is basically the two ions get excited, the blue curve is that one of the two ions gets excited. And the red curve you would expect is actually the square of the green curve, because it's just probability of one ion being excited and probability of two ions being excited, probability of two ions T squared. Okay. And if you would now square the green curve, basically it fits quite, quite nicely here. So there's no interaction. If you then apply the microwave, what will happen is that uh, these, the second transition here is shifted in energy, cannot be excited anymore, and due to that, this double ex uh, uh, excited state cannot be excited anymore. So the green curve, as before, the single ion case, and the right curve are not the square. So double ion excitation is, is, is strongly suppressed. So we see the replication. So, yes. Here, without interaction on the left, with interaction. Okay, now we wanted to go to a quantum gate, and uh, for making a quantum gate, we first tried actually to use this Rydberg blockade for a quantum gate, but the, Rydberg, the, the, the interaction was not really strong enough to use the, the, the shift for, for a quantum gate. So what we actually used instead is a so-called interaction gate. An interaction gate means you excite both ions really to the Rydberg state due to the fact that you now have this interaction, this energy level is shifted in energy. And if you now wait for a certain amount of time, it, time it will experience a phase due to this energy shift. Which means what we did is actually uh, the, it's more or more or less the proposal from Klaus Möhm from 2014, uh, applying syrup to the Rydberg state that both of these ions get excited. And it's now combined actually with this microwave pressing Trapped ions which were composed by the urine. So uh, we apply stirrup up and stirrup down of both of these ions at the same time. Both of these ions can get excited to a Rydberg state. And now, so this is a simulation of either a single ion being excited to a Rydberg state or both. And you see there's still quite a little lot of population of both of these ions being excited to a Rydberg state. If you look at the time scale here, the whole sequence here is more or less 700 nanoseconds, so it's below a microsecond. Okay. And uh, the interaction is about 2 megahertz, 1.9 megahertz or something like that, which means in this time of 700 nanoseconds, we would get a high pitch. Um, so that's what we do. We prepare our ions in the 0 or 1 state, that's our optical qubit. Uh, and uh, then we excite the ions to Rydberg state into these microwave states. There's this interaction. If both of these ions get excited to Rydberg state, so that's zero, if both of these ions get excited to Rydberg state, due to this energy shift, they will experience this phase shift. And if only one of them gets excited, there's no interaction, no phase shift, or if no ion is excited, also no interaction, no phase shift. So basically, you can get a controlled phase shift. OK, well, yeah, that's probably just a little bit more math of what I've said before. You can, of course, start starting in this position of 0 plus 1 in both of these lines. You can go to Rydberg state and back down. And of course, the 0, 0 state will appear in phase. If there is a phase of pi, it's better to control phase state, which means depending on which side the initial state was, the second line is either getting from the plus to minus. So it's a control phase. We can uh, uh, detect this control phase shift. So if the first ion was in zero, um, yeah, okay. so uh, yeah, here you get from the zero, zero, it actually gets a minus, or the other state plus. Uh, so this one gets a phase shift, while this one doesn't get a phase shift. So zero gives a control not, while one doesn't get a uh, control phase, while one doesn't. So if you detect the first line in zero, you get one phase. If you detect the first line in one, there's no phase. You can also do, after you prepare such a state here, you can rotate it into, by total pulse into a, a, effectively a belt state. And then you can do measure parity oscillations after that. And if you measure the parity oscillations on the state, then you get something like that. So, it's an entanglement operation that is operated below one microsecond time, so in 700 nanoseconds. 
And uh, fidelity is well, not perfect yet. We still have to work quite a lot on making that better. But it's a really nice task. If you compare that to other gates, chapter line gates, of course, that's not written like atom gates at the moment. If you compare chapter line gates, then actually there's only, as far as I know, really two gates that are below microseconds. Okay, so that's the, the Oxford group that uh, have driven the Mermesurmsen gate to a really, really, really fast speed. Uh, of course, then also the fidelity drops quite a lot. If they might make it a little bit slower, the fidelity is quite So, uh, but at least for sub microsecond case, they are more or less in the Of course, now the question is, can we reach somewhere, somehow further down? And uh, also maybe get even faster? And uh, if you look at the errors that we have, the readback state lifetime is actually not the dominant error in all of our gates. It's only a few percent at the moment. And if you go there to make the interaction even faster, then you could even put it further. So it actually scales as n to the power of minus 7 to r to the power of 3. So if you push the, uh, the, the distance of these lines further, closer together, the interaction goes up. And due to that also, you could do all the, the process much faster. Also, laser line width, well, it's very precise error, maybe at the moment. Uh, which is the laser line width, uh, mostly. Uh, the decay of the intermediate state and non adiabaticity also contribute quite a bit. So basically, non adiabaticity you can fight by making the running frequency of your lasers higher and due to that, uh, push the other levels further away so that you don't transfer so much population into the states by the stir-up process. And one big contribution that we actually have is the microwave power fluctuations. Because we actually drive this transition, the, the, the microwave dressing at something like 100 megahertz Rabbit frequency, and we are sensitive to 100 kilohertz of fluctuations of this level, which is the thousands of the, actually, the, the, the Rabbit frequency that we're driving, which means we are sensitive to the Rabbit frequency of this level. So maybe by using other schemes or making the power of the Rabbit frequency, the microwave much it's more stable, we suppress this error. Okay. Um, maybe one last point here, due to the, the, the error due to the motion. So effectively you have an interaction, and the interaction is of course now repelling, or attracting. <coughs> due to that, you of course also couple to the motion of the ion string, and you can calculate that for the number of ions, how much error you would actually have as a contribution. And since our ions are actually really tightly trapped, you actually don't couple to the motion so much, so there's not so much uh, uh, information going into the motion, and due to that, you have not much of an error due to this coupling. So, this is not a significant error, and even for longer line strings, that are not used. So, that was calculated by even by. You will find more details in this. Okay, I still have two, three minutes maybe. <laughs> um, okay, so. As Igor was already explained a little bit yesterday, the ions are highly polarizable, and due to that, in the electric field, if they move a little bit, they are polarized, and due to that, the uh, trapping potential is slightly modified. Which means, uh, in the ground state, there's one trapping potential, in the reflex state, there's another trapping potential. And you can detect it by the energy shift of these transitions, depending on the phonon number that you're we can measure this resonance shift for different phonon numbers, and of course, if you're Doppler cooled, you will have actually a distribution of populations here of these phonon numbers, and due to that, a line with broad enough of your transition. So this is basically the coherence process, because depending on your phonon number, you have a different <coughs> resonance that you're trying. Uh, so that's the line with broadening that you will experience. And due to that, we have actually, in our two ion entanglement operation, we have performed double cooling. There is a cooling. So we didn't do only double. But, and of course, also if you look, for instance, for radio oscillations or something like that, if you do sideband cooling, you see nice radio oscillations. For a double cool ion, it's basically deeper here. Well. But if you now go to these dressed levels of the microwave dress grid that states, this is now these levels that we use in these two ion entanglement operations, and this is the S level. So just S or S plus P or S minus P. 
So you see the parasitability actually goes in the other direction. And if you tune your microwave accordingly, you can actually reach the parasitability of your Rydberg state that is almost zero. Of course, then you don't have the perfect S plus P equal superposition and the maximum interaction anymore, but it's actually something like 50% of the interaction. So you can go to the zero parasitability. And if you do that, for instance here, it's not nice radio oscillations, but it gives you a little bit of a hint. So this is uh, S-state with sideband cooling. That was the S-state without sideband cooling. And this is the zero porosability state without sideband cooling. So you can drive radio oscillations into the zero porosability state, uh, even though you're not in the OK, the interaction. Of course, if you look now, how does it scale, actually, the interaction? Of course, it scales with the distance to the power of minus 3, which means if you push the ions closer together, everything speeds up. <coughs> uh, and uh, if you now go to more and more ions, in principle, the outermost ions actually push the ions closer together, and due to that, the interaction goes up. So if you go to a longer ion string, the interaction should be faster. Um, okay. I skipped that. That's too much. And what we now did is um, we went to a 12 ion string and only used the trend center two ions and we went to the zero porosability states. We did, apart from that, a complete uh, equal sequence that we had before. Now the ion distance, instead of 4.2 micrometer, is 3.3 micrometer. Due to that, we have a speed up that is compensating for these um, the, the zero porosability states, and we apply the same sequence apart from that. And when we do that, pretty much in data, of course, it's not really nice fidelity, but we can still get a little bit of entanglement just from a double cooled string, 12 ion string with two central ions. OK, to summarize, um, I showed you the rib blockade to two ion entanglement, mild rib interaction. There's quite strong emotional effects. And there's the first entanglement signal for the 12 ion string, which is equally fast as the 42 ion string uh, and can be used for just uh, Of course, we still have to work on fidelities quite a bit to make that interesting, really, for quantum computation. But uh, we know quite a bit of errors that we can work on. Most of them are technical. And uh, I think we can do quite a bit. These are the people working on it. There's she, Fabian, and Jared as students. And uh, Jared is postdoc at the moment, uh, doing the work mostly. And even like in library analysis. Then, thanks for your attention. And I'm like, uh, Um, so I've got two related questions. One is, do you see a, uh, the excitation to the Rydberg influence the lifetime of ion in the trap due to collisions, enhanced collisions with background atoms or black body? And the second is, the um, I know that in the Rydberg community, people have also performed gates not by exciting to Rydberg levels, but rather by dressing the ground state with some Rydberg excitation and then limiting the the population in the red black state. Of course, uh, okay, so first first question <laughs> is, uh, yes, we see double ionization by black body radiation mostly. So we think that's black body radiation. radiation. Uh, the rates that we see fit with uh, black body radiation, radiation uh, ionization. Uh, what we get is, in, if you just excite the red black state in weight, in something like one of 300 red black excitation, we lose the ion by double ionization. So we just get a double ionized ion here. Nice thing is we can actually throw it out quite easily just by changing the trap parameters. And uh, then the double ionized ion fly, fly out, and we can just by patient loading load in the trap. Okay. So that's it's possible. Of no course, it's an additional source of error. No enhanced chemistry? Uh, we haven't seen anything yet. I mean, uh, I think we only have seen uh, double ionized ions and no, no strong signal. Um, of course, you can suppress black body radiation quite a bit by just going to consciousness. So, in principle, the theory, many, many ways of magnitude are possible by just going to uh, Second question was 
uh, concern driving gates by not going to the Rydberg excitation, okay. but rather mixing some Rydberg Of course, you could do that. Of course, uh, that I don't think you can win infidelity so easily, uh, but of course, you're losing speed. So that's what we can do here. The long iron chain, uh, I'm just wondering how do you select only two ions? So we have a, a, a laser that only excites the um, to center ions into S plus D state, and only D, the D state, of course, gets excited. All the other ions stay in S, and due to that, they are not excited to the state. So we have an address 674 laser that tries to keep the transition. That's all. The, the Rydberg excitation is done by a virtual I have a question on the uh, role of the RF field. Does this create sidelines on the Rydberg transition and, and influence the pocket? Um, <clears throat> for uh, S and P states, there's not so much of sidelines that are appearing. So there's an, uh, we, we rather so for D states, you couple actually in the manifold of um, of D uh, three R or something like that, the different Siemens levels, and due to that, you get quite a lot of flow case sidelines. Um, for S and P <coughs> and half levels, it's not so critical yet because all the other levels that you could couple to are quite far away, and due to that, there's almost no sidelines. But it's it's a quadruple couple, quadruple couple anyway. Of course, if you then would shift it out of out of the center, you have also a type of electric field, and then of course you have the same type of. Yeah. Uh, about this general probability. I didn't fully really understand. So one case is uh, plus addition of SNP. The other case is uh, minus addition. Yes. And in between them. So it's just a, uh, so basically you go to the stress states. You detune a little bit from resonance. And due to that, you get an a mixture of p that is not equal to one to, to one half. Okay. Also population. Uh, but depending on where you are in this in this uh, other towns. Uh, scheme here. Ah, no, yes. Depending on where you are, it's either here's S, plus, uh, S minus P, here's S plus P, and if you go a little bit here or here, then you're in, in a different sort of position. But you, you just tune your two photon resonance to this point, you would put your, your microphone tuning to, I don't know, plus or minus 5 megahertz or something like that, and try to resonate inside to the stress state. Can I go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, like perhaps a similar question than uh, what, what Oli asked. Um, like this, this classical gate scheme, right, the, like the first proposed, I think, right, is based on the blockade. Yes. Where you actually not bring mm -hmm. those absolutes. And like if I'm not totally wrong, I think that would actually also make it insensitive to the microwave power. It would make it insensitive to microwave power. That's correct. Yes. So um, you, that you would gain 10 percent. So we a reason you don't we didn't have. Uh, so the, the reason why we didn't use the, use the blockade gate is uh, usually for blockade gates you need either an addressed operation, or uh, we tried for from non-addressed you we tried with composite path sequences, mm -hmm. but then uh, what we needed to do is rotating around the effective block. Axis X and Y, one after the other, and then if you change the spaces, actually you don't really drive it perfectly up, up anymore. And uh, if there's no block, perfect blockade, then you actually have to consider more levels. And then, but I think there's now in Lukens group they have uh, done also something similar that actually should also work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's it. And we certainly will try. So we have we, exactly we are in the in the Rydberg state and the Rydberg state is sensitive to the black body radiation and then we lose the electron there. Due to that we have then just a double ionized ion inside. And of course we cannot use it for any quantum information anymore. We have to get rid of it and, and uh, load anymore. Um, but uh, of course Black body radiation can be suppressed. But uh, it's basically limiting our, all our measurements at the moment. 
all the statistics that we have, the, the error bars are often quite big compared to other experiments in compliance. That's basically due to the sometimes. <coughs> well, Tony? So, is, is, so, looking at this diagram now, I forget if this is what you did the gate on. Is, is the setting plus 46 for the bird state the optimal end? No, and I don't think that n, n plus 46 is the optimal n. Uh, it's a level that we were conveniently able to work with. But uh, we have gone already to n equal to 56, and uh, if we do proper microvision compensation, I think we could also use n equal to 56. So, and then, of course, the, all the interaction would go <coughs> quite a bit up, because uh, the interaction would extend to the power 4, and it would increase the interaction. And we will try that, but uh, at the moment we just use it. There are these higher angular, state, <coughs> angular states, Fritbergs, where you gain in lifetime. So it, it, just out of curiosity, why is nobody aiming to get there? <coughs> so the, 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 it's, it's actually connected to these floquet sidebands that we were that I said before. Uh, the in, in the high angular momentum states, you actually have coupling of the of the different levels, also of lower angular moment, two lower angular momentum, wire the uh, the quadrupolar coupling, by the electric fields of the quadrupolar, and this mixes all of these levels. And due to that, the lifetime might not be so good anymore. We've tried to calculate a little bit. Uh, there might be levels that are still longer lived, uh, and uh, of course, at some point, we will need to investigate it further. But then you have to go, of course, into the, uh, the completely coupled system of I and trap plus, plus I. And trap. So I think we have to move on to the next talk. So let's thank Markus again. Joanna is setting up the talk. is going to be given by uh, Giovanna Morigi from um, the uh, Saarland or Saarbrücken Uni University, so the University of uh, Saarland, and she will be talking about kinks and defects in iron crystals. So I don't know how to deal with this microphone. I will try. It's going to be embarrassing. Uh, so I have to switch on. Do the cameras here? So first, I would like to thank the, the organizer. Michael, Michael, uh, Thomas, Hussein, for the possibility to be here and to talk about our work. I have changed a bit uh, the talk with respect to what I uh, announced because I realized that there are some results that I never presented in front of the iron experimentalist. Some of them have been are being discussed together with um, John Bollinger, but I would like uh, also to review them here. And these are topological defects of phase transition of two-dimensional ion crystal structures. The second part uh, is on the franker kondorov model, and in particular on the commensal and the commensal transition with ion chain. And what I'm going to discuss is how this property, so first I will introduce the commensal and commensal transition, and then I will discuss how these properties are modified by the Coulomb interaction between the ions. So here I take uh, my favorite picture, which is stolen by one of uh, Michael Michael uh, presentation, and I'm going to talk about topological defects. And this is the second picture, favorite picture, is 
a paper of John Moringer collaborators of 2012, and it shows you a planar structure in a pen trap with where you can see the triangular order of the atoms. The triangular order, of course, is in the center, it becomes disorder at the border because of the finite size effect. Now, we have been asking, together with Shmuel Fishman, Rat Shushoni, and Tanya Podorsky, what is the structural instability that leads uh, this planar structure to a three-dimensional structure? And the first thing we want to think about is uh, that this phase transition is like a backring transition, in the same way as when you have this solid rope, and elastic rope, and you tend to squeeze it so that it either bend on one side or on the other. So you expect that the ions go off plane and to bend it on one side means that certain ions will go in one direction and other in the other direction and vice versa. So now I present it like uh, one would uh, approach it from the first time and say, okay, this is a triangular, triangle of the structure, this is the next time, so we are showing the triangle. And then uh, if I think in terms of the backring transition, then say one eye will go off plane in this direction, the other eye will go off plane in the other direction, and now you have a problem because you have a triangular structure and you have some sort of frustration if you think that the eyes can just be displaced up and down. Now actually the solution is quite simple. This eye doesn't move, it stays there on the plane. And in fact this is not uh, anything new, but it's a bit of a super small uh, prediction in a plot made by Daniel Dubin using a mean field type of calculation. So what you see here is the displacement with respect to the plane set. When it is zero, the ions are on the plane. When it, divide, divide, uh, when it becomes different from zero, the ions go off plane. But what you see is something that is equivalent to the aspect ratio between the axial and the transverse component. So the backing transition would be here in one group as and see this small uh, segment that leads to the fact that there are two planes, but these two planes uh, actually have a different order than the triangular order. But indeed, uh, if you saw here, see here, in this region, there are three planes, and these three planes are three triangular structures where there is a triangular structure on in plane, one triangular structure in the upper plane, and one triangular structure in the lower plane. I think they are shown here, the plus are the iron going up, the square are the ion, are the nodes, and the dots are the ion staying down. And if you bring them together, they squeeze them together on the plane, they will give you the original triangular structure. So I'll show it again here. And what you see plus, say, are the ion that go up, minus are the ion that go in the lower plane, and the empty dots are the ion the staying plane. And this actually, this transition can be identified with a mode, an excitation mode of uh, the plane that goes soft. And this excitation mode is given by, say, this is the brilliant zone, this is the excitation uh, brilliant zone corresponding to this triangular lattice. This k vector and this k star vector are the known uh, uh, vectorable vector one into the other. And they give you practically what are the oscillations on the plane. So if you look on the, on the lowest oscillation that becomes soft, then say you have one ion that is at the node, one that is oscillating up and then down, and going on like that. Now you see that you have uh, three possibility. So this could be the node, this could be the node, this could be the node, and you have also for each node the two possibility, this oscillate ion goes up and this down, and then if this is just an excitation, at some point that they will reverse their amplitude. So now if one thinks in terms of a phase transition and one would like to identify an order parameter, one can identify the order parameter, analogously like what we did for the linear zigzag, with the displacement of the ion I with respect to the plane. And now this displacement is going to be the real part of a complex parameter. And this complex parameter is complex because of the phase of this oscillation. And this phase can take six possible values, and these six possible values are indicated here, and correspond to the six possible values of the oscillation about the system. So if one would like to think of uh, the formation of this plane in terms of a symmetry breaking type of phase transition, 
then you have a symmetric state in the situation in which all ions practically oscillate or say tunnel across the plane. And this means that uh, all the six possible phases, all the six possible displacement, all the six possible type of oscillation coexist, uh, and each of them corresponds to one of these arrow. And the broken symmetry, so the fact that now the plane becomes uh, frozen on a certain configuration, is saying one of the six possible phases, and one of the six possible phases is, for instance, this type of crystal, where this ion is the node, and this ion go in the upper plane, and this ion go in the lower plane. So I repeat, because it's a sort of abstraction of a model that is actually very simple to visualize. Now, everyone would like to see what is the model that governs this phase transition. Well, what would you do? We take the Newtonian, kinetic energy, Coulomb interaction, trap frequency, start to expand about the equilibrium position. What you get uh, in a big mess, you have a really long range of system, it's two dimensional, with Coulomb interaction, it's very difficult to truncate, the symmetry gives rise to a non transparent way to identify the dominant contributions. So it's much better to think in terms of symmetries and then gu guided by the symmetry, one goes back to the calculation of the initial and sort out the terms. So watch which symmetries are broken in the transition from one to three planes. Well, one symmetry is very simple. You have a plane, you go from a plane to a three-dimensional structure, you break the symmetry about reflection on the about for reflection about the plane. So the mirror reflection about the plane corresponds here if one looks at the uh, at the order parameter to change the sign of the displacement. So it brings it to psi to minus psi. There is a, a second symmetry which is broken, is that symmetry by, by translation, about one of the two primitive lattice vectors. Actually, one can see that it's sufficient to take one, and if one takes the other two symmetry, one can reconstruct the other. And this corresponds, say, if one goes along A1 to a phase 2 pi i over 3, which corresponds right, to shifting one node to a one point to the next one. Remember, we take all with the real part. Then there is a third symmetry, which corresponds to this set of symmetry, which are sufficient to practically reproduce any other possible symmetry in the system. So see, if you take this axis, if you create the plane, you break the symmetry about reflection about this axis, which are my colleagues. Now, if you write the symmetry in terms of this complex order parameter, this corresponds to take the complex complex. Okay, so now if we take these uh, symmetries and we want to, to construct a Landau, a Ginsburg Landau free energy, then we end up with a so-called six-state clock model. So this is a five-four model, differently from the linear tic-tac in the one to two dimension. Now we have the complex, but the complex of the parameters, so we make the absolute value. This five-four model gives rise. Uh, to an instability, to a uh, type of uh, lexical head where we have, however, a free mode, uh, which is a phase, and it is uh, like a boost, uh, the disk because the type of phase transition. In order to reflect uh, this uh, phase, broken symmetry by translation, then we need a further term, it has a six power to the six term, and this term here gives you a phase locking once the uh, phases, the uh, symmetry by translation is broken. This is called the six state clock model. There is also the four state clock model in case you have four possible phases. There is a two state clock model, etc. etc. Et it's actually a model that has raised a lot of interest uh, in the context of gauge theory. And it has been first uh, studied extensively in this work by Cosa et al. And this al include also Catalan. Now, in our model, these parameters, we can reconstruct them by going back to the original uh, Coulomb interaction, uh, take into account uh, the expansion and the, about uh, the coefficients of the, uh, of the energy about uh, the uh, planar configuration. So this term here, R, is particularly controlled by the trap aspect ratio. By, so by controlling the trap aspect ratio, one obtains that that goes from, neg from positive to negative, and then this time becomes relevant. And the more far away one goes from the instability, the more psi becomes larger, the more this time becomes relevant. I will note here. Yeah. 
left hand side. What is on the left hand side? This thing here is the Landau free energy, the peaceful Landau free energy that we reconstruct from the world. This uh, uh, term here is the gradient that comes from the interaction. And actually one point is that the interaction are effectively short range, despite the fact that the model is the Coulomb interaction model in two dimensions, and the effective short range uh, is indeed valid uh, for the transverse instability closer to the critical point. So what I report here is a phase diagram, which is well known from the six state clock model. What you have here is a trap, trap aspect ratio, and you have the temperature, and this point here would be the point corresponding to the point find from the mean field type of calculation. So put in temperature, or put in front fluctuation equal to zero, and put in quantum fluctuation equal to zero. So this is the point uh, of uh, the transition from one to three planes uh, found uh, by the mean field uh, um, uh, program of Dubin. And actually, by adding the quantum fluctuation, this point is shifted, and it is shifted by a quantity that scales like the kinetic energy over the Coulomb energy, and it is, can be for, uh, say, the radio miles of the um, 50 micrometer distance of the order of 100 to kilohertz. That's a very small shift. Now, from this side to this side, uh, indeed, uh, there is instability, but the quantum fluctuation gives you thundering about, or about all the possible configurations. So you get a symmetric state in which all po six possible planes are coexistent. And when you go and decrease the trap aspect ratio, then you enter a situation in which you have uh, a symmetry broken state, so the phase is locked, uh, and one of the six possible directions is chosen. Now, actually, you observe that I have uh, two lines. And this line in the middle is, uh, first of all, uh, give rise to a layer whose width goes to zero. The fact that it goes to zero is something that has not so far been uh, proven as a hypothesis. Also, prove it numerically is quite complex. And this uh, region in the middle is the region where the model is dominated, the criticality of the model is dominated by this 5 to the 4 term, and give rise to a BKT type of phase where one has a quasi-order and the transition from this disorder to the, the BKT type of phase transition to from this uh, uh, symmetric to this quasi-ordered phase is described in terms of uh, three vortices that then binds in vortex and anti-vortex pairs. And one, if one looks at it, one sees a correlation function. That this, one looks at correlation between the phases. One obtains a correlation function with decays algebraically. And the exponent of this uh, decay depends on the temperature, on the parameter which is called the superfluid, superfluid stiffness. We don't have any superfluidity. But the stiffness is, say, the stiffness of the crystal against the formation in the transverse direction. And this rho s practically depends on air, so on the trap frequency. So now to think in terms of vortices is very nice, and uh, we like it, but uh, to think in terms of vortices and bring it back to this runner structure and to the formation of these three planes requires some thinking, and uh, I bring here uh, an example taken from a paper for a four-state clock model of Leo Valens and collaborators. So if you think of the displacement of the creation of the plane in terms of this arrow. One arrow is a possible ordering. Now we take four possible ordering. So you get cluster where you get ordering in a certain direction, and then a cluster of ordering in other direction. And now if you look, vortices in the system correspond to situation in which you get vortices in this ordering according to these six possible directions. So I make uh, a remark that I made before. So this is a two Coulomb crystal. It is actually incompressible because of the Coulomb interaction. So it is a long range order self-organized structure. Yet so the instability is described by an effective short range model, as I said before. Observation of the critical uh, behavior is uh, uh, accessible. Sorry, I, this is a, a, a slide that should have disappeared by means of sub-doppler coil. So the T uh, K T that we find uh, 
here is of the order of another microcarton for very lines with 15 micrometer distance. The, this, uh, the value of T6, when one observes uh, the second transition is at one fifth, so it would be resolved. It requires to go below to the order of 20 microcarton cooled. And the interlayer distance requires a resolution at the diffraction limit. I don't report here the numbers because there were more actually more recent numbers that have been discussed between John and uh, Schmuel, in which they looked at uh, the interlayer distance and the precision you require. So one way we are thinking of uh, for measuring this uh, uh, the creation of the T-plex is by means of Rans interferometry. Here I report a proposal that we published more or less eight years ago. For the linear tic-tac, so assume we have an initial state where you use the internal degrees of freedom of the ions. You say create the ion in the ground state, you prepare the ion in the ground state, and the system say in the ground state of the, of the linear structure or of, an, of a certain structure. And then a pulse is applied and brings the central ion, say, to the excited state, where it feels a spin-dependent force, and the spin-dependent force is such that it deforms the structure and brings it to the other structure across the phase transition. Then a certain time is left elapsed, and then the pulse is brought, uh, is applied again to bring uh, the ion back to the ground state. Of course, this cannot be perfectly undone because of the excitation that are no longer localized along the chain, and the probability to be in the ground state uh, reflects uh, the excitation, and in particular, it can be connected to the autocorrelation half function of the field. So by means of that, uh, one can do it across, say, instability, and one sees that uh, the visibility and the Fourier transform of the visibility as a function of the lapse time gives a way to measure the gap uh, across the phase transition. I will say further details, and I go to the second part of the talk. If you are interested, we can discuss it in the coffee break or in the discussion. So now I talk about iron crystal in optical lattices, and I will focus on the <coughs> Kregel controller and on the Kregel controller in presence of the Coulomb interaction. And now I ask my chairman, how much time do I have? Ah, 10 to 15. 15, OK. <laughs> <laughs> So I will uh, start uh, by taking a chain of particles. So I print interaction with the particle distance equal to A. And now uh, a <coughs> substrate, an optical lattice, is added, and this optical lattice has a periodicity B, and B is equal to A. So if B is equal to A, you don't change the structure, the interparticle distance. But of course, you peel it the particles at the minimum, and by doing this you introduce the gaps because you break the translational symmetry by, uh, by translation of the whole chain, and this gives rise uh, to the fact that now the zero phonon mode, uh, the, the lowest phonon mode is not zero. Now if you choose instead uh, that this periodicity is incommensurate with A, in general you will have what is called uh, the incommensurate phase uh, if this uh, Lattice is sufficiently uh, weak, so not to perturb the ordering of the ion. And uh, this incommensurate phase is characterized by the fact that if you look at the ion and with respect to the position or to the minima of the lattice, these are going to be displaced, and this displacement, if they are localized, they are going to be called kink, and this kink <coughs> separates commensurate region in certain regime. So whenever you get uh, the formation of kinks of whose size is smaller than fund chunks of commensurate segments, then you get uh, some big commensurate phase, and the phase becomes incommensurate when the kinks are at the same. So if the size of the king is much smaller than the commensurate chunks, the phase is commensurate. If it becomes compa comparable, it becomes, it's incommensurate. So now this is a transparency that uh, we saw also yesterday in the talk of uh, uh, Orientantan, it has been prepared by Thomas Fogarty some time ago, and it shows uh, uh, some few features, uh, key features uh, of uh, the model that uh, describes, uh, uh, catches uh, uh, the properties of this transition in one dimension. It is the Frankel Contrava model, it has been introduced in this paper, and it, is, it consists in a chain of oscillators with nearest neighbor interaction at the particle distance A, to which a substrate potentially is overlapped 
with the periodicity B. And now the parameter V, if you choose A over B equal to say to a golden ratio of Fibonacci number, so if you choose A over B equal to any of these particular golden irrational number, is such that you get uh, the uh, control of the resulting structure by the amplitude of V with respect to the interaction. And in particular, if V is below a certain critical value Vc, then you get a frictionless phase or a sliding phase, where practically uh, to put the chain into motion, you get the vanishing force, whereas a gap occurs when V is above Vc, so the phase becomes spent, and you get commensurate part, separated by things. And this is what is called the emergence effect that this work is final. This is an emergence called the method of a static friction to be um, distinguished from the dynamical friction. Now, I show three works uh, that uh, are one that the Enrico model that uh, is discussed on, for trapped ion and two other realize it uh, in presence of an optical lattice. And I also mention these distinguished colleagues, two of them were present here, and one of them is very close to realize this model in absence of an external trap. Now, uh, in uh, this paper, that is uh, a very nice uh, study of the grid transition, the focus was on the slide to pay transition for both relations, but I would like now to extend this uh, consideration to generic ratio A over B. In fact, uh, and for the cases discussed before, A over B was fixed, but the, in general, the classical ground state properties are determined by also this ratio, not only by the ratio V over K, this type of B, I was showing with one with respect to And what you see here is a plot from Rubensky and Chatkin, and now for some reason the reference doesn't appear, where you see here this ratio, so the ratio of the depth of the potential with respect to the interaction as a function of the ratio between the characteristic frequency of the chain interaction in absence of the substrate over the periodicity of the substrate. So when V0 is equal to 0, you have a phase which is incommensurate or commensurate, you don't care, it depends what is A with respect to B, but you don't see substrate potential, but if you start to increase the substrate potential, then you see that the incommensurate phases, which are this shaded line, becomes smaller, shift around, and uh, the system becomes pinned and forming commensurate phases. Now I take a cut of, uh, and I show what is called AF as a function of A. What is AF? It is uh, like the mean uh, interparticle distance uh, that emerges when you apply the substrate. It is the, this, the uh, uh, displacement of the ion n minus the displacement of the first ion divided by the number of ions. If you have a perfect commensal chain or a negligible number of kinks, this is practically equal to the length of the chain unperturbed. If you have the perturbation of the lattice, you're going to see changes. Now see, the lattice is equal to zero, AF is equal to A. Okay? No wonder, because you don't see the lattice. So A, the interparticle distance is determined by the interaction. Now, if you start to increase the zero, but you keep it much smaller, much smaller than the uh, interaction, then you see that this structure is preserved, but you start to see steps. And the steps are locking. So it tells you that even if uh, you have uh, that A over B is not exactly that commensurate value, yet the chain remains locked in that commensurate phase. And now, if you go in the other regime where V0, the amplitude of the lattice is much larger than the interaction, you get a fractal structure, so you get all this blocking in all the possible phases according to, the, to a scheme that reflects the density of rational number in the real axis. So now, I make a few considerations. The commensal the commensal transition is a continuous phase transition at, at, fi at the finite ratio uh, A over B. This also disappeared. The ground state, uh, oh no, v, sorry, V0 over K B squared so should be here. Uh, the ground state uh, is unique, but we are for, uh, above uh, in the commensal phase, there is a very, and also in the pin phase, uh, there is an extremely large number 
of metastable state whose energy is very close to the ground state and the difference in energy decays with the size of the system. So because it uh, goes to zero with the size of the system. And it's actually a very interesting transition in several other contexts as we discussed for superconductivity, for cleaning of borders, lattices. For the fractional quantum ball effect, the fractional quantum ball effect uh, has several features that can be mapped to the conventional and the conventional phase transition, and the kinks can be associated with fractional excitations. Also, for the modulus rate of superfluid phase transition, we know that kind of transition. So, it is a quite interesting and broad property. So, now, one thing we asked uh, was first of all, the kinks, what are the property of the kinks if you take the long range? Coulomb interaction, how does it change? Because also the size of the thing is relevant, in particular in order to see whether the commensal phase uh, survive with the long range interaction. So we know that it survives, but we, may, we, we know it from a spin model, but we look at it uh, by means of a continuum model for the, for the ions. So we define a phase, theta j, and this theta j, what it is, it is the shift of the ion, so the position of the ion with respect to the next commensurate position. So that's the closest commensurate position. Divided by D. So you can write it as a phase, you can write it as a displacement. You write it as a phase that is um, uh, convenient because you get the dimension as part of uh, So then uh, by taking the equation of you get an energy, by, by means of the energy you end up to a type of equation that is a type of sine Gordon equation we have here as a called the static solution. This is the derivative with respect to the position. This goes like V0 sin square, sin square theta and epsilon is the energy. Nothing here depends on the displacement ratio on the ratio A over B. Only V0 tells you what is the amplitude with respect to the interaction. But uh, the this commensuration is important when you plug uh, the solution, which is the king, uh, back into the energy. And you see where the energy depends on the discommensuration, and you see whether the energy of the king is above or below the energy of the commensurate phase. And if it is above, then uh, the king is in excitation, and if it's below, be below, then you get uh, a spontaneous production of kings. So now what happens if you have the, the long range interaction? So we do it in this limit in which the periodicity of the lattice is much smaller than the interparticle distance. Okay? And uh, in this limit, we substitute uh, this term with the term that we get from the Taylor expansion of the Coulomb interaction to the second order. And u i is here the displacement with respect to the equilibrium position of the ion chain, and k i j is now the uh, term that we get from the Taylor expansion. In this case, is one over the distance between the ion to the third. So now this is actually for Coulomb, but uh, the extension to other type of power interaction is straightforward if you substitute here 3 with n plus 2. So now by taking this uh, uh, this phase, this displacement, we can make a continuum limit by assuming that uh, by taking that this uh, distance of this period A is much larger than the possible displacement, so we can treat the displacement in the continuum limit. Now Z corresponds to Xj over A, and by means of this we get uh, an equation, which is the same equation like the one I was showing before, with a difference, so now we have an integral here, and this integral comes from the long range thing. So it's no longer a differential equation, this is the equation of motion, it's not the equation for the, the one that we get by integrating. And uh, uh, the terms, uh, so if you set uh, the long range interaction to zero, then you go back to the equivalent equation for the king who is nearest neighbor interaction. If you put the Coulomb interaction, then you get terms as scale one as one over the distance times the gradient of the king solution. So it's integral differential is a bit complex, sorry. The solution doesn't say much. I saw you here numerically. What is the king? for the short range interaction compared to the one that we get for the full model with the long range interaction. This is the ion position for a chain of 200 ions. This is the displacement. And you see that here the ions are locked in the commensurate phase. Here they are also locked in the commensurate phase. Here they start to be displaced and give rise to the kink. And the kink 
is larger because of the Coulomb interaction, which is actually no longer my very passive interaction, which tends to increase the distance and uh, give rise to a size uh, that we estimate to be of the order of four times the size of the king in absence of the Coulomb interaction from the SDA. From this uh, analytic model, we can start the algebraic decay, the, the decay of the king. We get an algebraic decay that goes as one over the distance squared. And from this, we can extract, determine what is the interaction between kings. And the king, king, king interaction is a coulomb line interaction, which is actually no wonder because these are stress charges. So if you have all the opposite of the stress charges, so kings will interact according to the charge that they see in different regions. Now, I should be sincere and say that uh, this uh, type of prediction has been also appeared in a different shape, but uh, it appeared also in the work of Brown, Kirchner, and all the authors who have looked uh, at a similar uh, treatment by the means of a potential that uh, was replacing the Coulomb potential in order to avoid the singularity. So there were some phenomenological assumptions in the book. So I will be now saying that uh, there is a second point. So now you have these kinks. Uh, can you still uh, actually the weight uh, of the Interaction potential is larger in case like the logarithm of the number of particles. It was a problem that also Alexei Goshkov mentioned yesterday. And it gives rise to, a, if you increase the number of ions, to a larger and larger contribution of the interactions. Now, this can be rescaled. And this rescaling tells you that you expect a transition, and a final transition from condensate to condensate if you use what is called this tax cut rescaling. By means of this country scaling, then one sees that uh, if you take a chain of spins, and the chairman stands up, and will be faster. If you take a chain of spin <laughs> in a similar model, then you get the uh, David staircase, and this David staircase uh, uh, gives you a finite uh, size uh, of uh, this locking uh, region. So they are going to see also the locking to a commensurate phase, even for pool of interaction. And uh, one can map the child to the same model, and we did it here, and I will not show it. The signature of the condenser to condenser are visible in two uh, measurements. One is the measurement of the mode spectrum, the second is the measurement of the, is the black scattering, the, the structure for factor. The structure for factor will tell you where the ions lock, what are the interparticle position. I would like, uh, I wanted to say something about the quantum free control, but I didn't do it, but I will tell you in an outlook that uh, we are looking for observable for king quantum correlation. We would like to understand the quantum convergence and convergence for power law interaction, and then start the sequences across the convergence to convergence phase transition, and connect the kings uh, to possible fractional charges, and so get some simulator of the fractional law effect. Thank you. Differences from uh, between Vladan's experiments and Tanya's experiments on, on looking on vector control model. Uh, so Tanya Mirschlag uh, basically had uh, yeah, two time chains next to each other. Yes. Yeah. And studied uh, the mode spectrum. Yes. I assume that it, for me the systems look somewhat. It looks like they are the same, but. Uh. So I say yes and no. <laughs> so I say me and <laughs> Yes, because uh, it is true that you can uh, substitute the substrate with the second chain. Uh, no, because uh, the two chains interact. And in the model in which you put the substrate, which is an optical lattice, you uh, practically have no detection of the chain over the substrate. Now, uh, there are works uh, for, uh, uh, that I've analyzed, whether you can also uh, study in a 
ecosystem and uh, weigh this uh, back action because actually this is what uh, you would expect. I mean, if you use the Franklin Trova for simulating, for, a, for a, um, let's say, describing the interaction of uh, the of two crystals, put one on top of the other, or the growth of the crystal on some other structure, they will, there are two physical objects that will interact. So the formation of the structure will affect the second structure, and there should be some nonlinearity. So there, is, there are some works that uh, uh, put this nonlinearity by hand in the potential. So they don't take this sinusoidal potential, but assume that the amplitude of the potential is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, affected by, uh, by the ordering. So the most related pain, I think, are the, so the first people who did it and a series of people have been working on it. But as far as I know, it's a very complex problem to study. So, okay, and your results cannot be easily transferred to this. So, so if I, where I can make a series of approximations, and I can transfer the results uh, to the case uh, of uh, the experiment of Daniel Stoddard and collaborators. Now, I don't think that uh, uh, the theory that I develop here uh, would be valid in the limit uh, in which one starts to see the transitions. So the formation of the, of the, uh, from the, the transition from time to time. So it would be very in certain limitations. But honestly, I look at it uh, very uh, superficially because I was a bit scared of this uh, complex. Yeah. What we discussed is the computation system, the two systems, and we have made a simulated calculation for a certain uh, system. I found that we need a symmetry of more of the micro trivial more of the IPFC, I guess it could be uh, more of the sounds to the the meaning of the model, I guess. Yes, yes. But I'm just wondering, I mean, when you have this panel system, then of course, uh, these experiments, you might not have the same temperature in plane as out of plane. I mean, I mean, I'm just wondering, do you have any, do you have any feeling for, I mean, do you need to have the same <laughs> temperature in order to dimension in order to, 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 to see this, or would it suffice to have it in, let's say, just perpendicular to the plane? So, uh, I think this, I had this question also from John. <laughs> uh, I try to remember. So, I my first reaction would be that uh, the important temperature. So, since this is a model, this is a model where we practically decouple uh, the uh, axial excitation from the transverse excitation. My first reaction is that you need uh, to cool the transverse excitation. Now, there are no linearities. This gives rise to Cochrane, and uh, uh, the axial excitation gives rise to vibration about uh, the position that will uh, give rise to a modulation of the distance. And this I don't know which effect we can have. It has to be taken into account, but I think it can be separate, separately taken into account. So it's, you can add that, them up like independent effects, I think. Is that very short? Yeah, I hope it's short. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the how, how this one case, like uh, if uh, the mass of, instead of uh, beryllium, mass is increasing, then the temperature will be decreasing or increasing. Also, distance is shorter, then the required temperature for this criticality is will be increasing or decreasing. So if I decrease air, you mean? Let me see. Uh, now you have uh, the case of uh, beryllium and the 15 micrometer, right? Yeah. So if the mass of the atom is increasing, ah, okay, then finished. the temperature, how that scale? Will decrease. Will decrease. Yes. Uh, and the distance is shorter than... Uh, it will... Uh, if the distance is shorter, the temperature will increase. Okay, so I think we have to <coughs> uh, move any further questions to the coffee break. And first, let's uh, thank Joanna. Yeah.
Just give me a hint when you're in the okay. Good.
Did go through? Yeah, good. Yeah, were you involved? Cannot say a thing. Cannot, cannot say a thing. Just, just asking. It didn't go through. It's a I know nothing. You remember this? Well, I give it for me either. Yeah, <laughs> of course we shouldn't know anything. Just the result. <laughs> the result is good. That's all that, it can, that, all that counts. <laughs> good. All right, I'll let you hook up. How are you? I'm doing fine. Uh, you may know I'm, I'm now at UMass Boston. If you don't know that, you know, uh, the King Dean. It's for people always give me this really. <laughs> what happened to you? No, it's just uh, for you. Uh, personal reason in the sense that uh, they offered a job to me and my wife, and you come did not. So the choice was easy. So okay, well, I'll we'll be in this place. She was at University of Rhode Island, which is an hour and a half drive in small roads. So, well, it's 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 very tiring. Because also, she's uh, in the business school, which means they teach evening classes. Okay. She would get home at 10.30 at night, and then I had to be a very nice guy, which is not my nature. So, <laughs> so, so when this thing came up, I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll go for it. We'll be in Boston. Boston is nice. I, I just took this, the, the subway to come here. So at some point, when you're in town, let me know. We'll get you to give a talk over there. Okay, sure. You know, you know Maxine was showing oh, There's yeah. few people that... He was in California, he was in USC. It was at USC, yeah, it was at USC, and then there's few other people that... Uh, that uh, are doing, uh, there's nobody doing uh, arms, although... Uh, as the dean, I can try to push me. <laughs> <laughs> So any any uh, great results since uh, the last one I saw? Or, I don't know, when was the last one? Probably one of the. I don't know. 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 So, just all sorts of, uh, well, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. and stances, but, well, all sorts uh, of coherent so control. I will see you. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
Ja, aber du kannst jetzt zum Beispiel
for having us here on this lovely workshop. I'd like to start by thanking Giovanna's team. <laughs> so Giovanna forgot to thank her team, so she asked me to put uh, this transparency. In particular, I'd like to thank Shraddha, Sharma, Rebecca Krauss, and Andreas. <laughs> um, and also, thanks to Giovanna's collaborators. Uh, in particular, I'd like to mention Shmuel Fishman, who passed away this year. Shmuel was a great theoretician, who worked with the Technion. Um, Okay, so um, so so what I'd like to tell you about today um, is about actually three experiments that we recently done at uh, our group of cations at the Weizmann Institute. All have to do with uh, dynamic and spectral control of cation crystals. This is a 
um, many body ion workshops, so I promise not to show any experiment that uses a single ion. All these experiments would use two ions and more. Um, all these experiments were not done by me, but rather by a group of hardworking and talented PhD students whose names are here, and I'll mention people who led different experiments as, as we go on. So the three, three experiments um, I'd like to describe. Um, the first one is the realization of robust entanglement gates. We all use entanglement gates, or many of us use entanglement gates more and more and more. These gates are susceptible to errors. And what I'd like to describe is the design and implementation of uh, entanglement gates that are robust against, against various errors. The second experiment I'd like to discuss is how we are able to take long iron strings which suffer from inhomogeneous quadruple shifts if you're trying to drive transitions that have quadruple shifts. And I'd like to describe a dynamic decoupling technique that gets rid, gets rid of this, um, these um, uh, quadruple shifts. And last, I'd like to describe a way, uh, an experiment in which we use an entangled state in order to perform precision measurement of uh, isotope shifts. So the first experiment uh, is that of robust entanglement gates. This, this experiment was led by Yotam Shapira. Actually, also the ideas that I presented here were uh, ideas that Yotam came up with during his master's thesis, which I think is a remarkable, uh, remarkable achievement for a young scientist. OK, so uh, I think that the, the main workhorse of trapped ion quantum computing in terms of entangling ions in a quantum register is the molmer sorensen gate. And in the molmer sorensen gate, the variation of the molmer sorensen gate we implemented in our lab uses an optical transition between a ground S state and an optically excited D orbital uh, of strontium plus. Uh, and the, I think the first experiments of implementing the molmer sorensen in an optical transition were done, uh, were done in Innsbruck. Other groups have used uh, other types of qubits, microwave, uh, Zeeman qubits, in order to drive the molmer sorensen interaction. In short, uh, what you do is you use a two-tone, so bi-frequency uh, field that connects the two qubit levels, and it's slightly off resonance from the red and blue sidebands of a singly excited uh, ion, where the two-ion transition, so the, in our case, the SS to DD, is on resonance. And when you do that, uh, this is uh, data from our lab, uh, after about 150 microseconds, we could prepare a coherent superposition of uh, the two ions being the SS and the DD states. Now, the molmer sorensen gates are, are great. We perform them with a fidelity somewhere between 98 and 99 percent. The best that was demonstrated so far is a, a 3.9 uh, fidelity. They're very good, but they are susceptible to errors. So if you have imperfections in different parameters uh, in your gate drive, you're going to suffer from errors. And these examples for such parameters are the gate time, the trap frequency, the laser detuning, carrier coupling, uh, and so on. So what we set up to do is to try and find a way to mitigate uh, uh, these errors, to robustify the gates. So again, uh, the molmer sorensen uses a bichromatic field where there's a, 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 a carrier transition, that the frequency that couples the, the S to D transition, but then you add up two sidebands, the plus and the minus here refers to two sidebands. They're almost resonant with a, with a, a motional sideband the frequency of that motion is new, and it's offset by some detuning, some gate detuning uh, psi naught from this transition. The sum of these two frequencies, again, matches the transition from the SS to the DD. Now, it turns out that you can actually write the time evolution of uh, the ions during the gate, and what you get is a time evolution operator that looks like this. Um, you have uh, a displacement both in momentum and in position. This pl displacement is spin dependent. JY is the total spin of the two ions, the sum of the tau dy of one and the tau dy of two, which means that as a function of time, your, ion is gonna, your ions are going to go through phase space. This is the x and the p direction of the phase space uh, in some trajectory, and the trajectory would be parameterized by these functions g of t and f of t. Okay? Now, in addition to this, uh, you're going to have uh, a phase acquired by the two ions, and the phase would depend on the collective spin states of the two ions. So what are the requirements for this drive to be a valid gate, for the gate to be successful? What you want is at the end of the gate, when the time equals t, the, the gate time, for motion to be disentangled from spin, and that means that this trajectory has come full circle back to where you started it from. 
And the phase that you acquired, which is proportional to the area that you're encircled in phase space, has to be equal to pi over 2 for you to be able to entangle the lines. If these two criteria are met, then if you start in both lines in the S state and you apply this gate, you get your entangled your entangled superposition. Okay, so how can we take this gate and generalize it to a family of gates and add more degrees of freedom to the problem? The way you do it is by adding, or one way to do it is by adding more frequency tones to your grade to right. So instead of having just a single detuning here, we add multiples of the detuning. N here is an integer number, and you'd like it to be an integer number in order for all these tones to end up at the zero motion at the end of the gate. Okay? So this allows you to generalize the gate to, to a family of gates, if you like. Um, there are some conditions that you can uh, give on the phase of these, of these different uh, tones. So these different tones have amplitudes, these amplitudes are complex numbers. You can play with their magnitude, the size of this R. You can play with the phase. You can constrain the phase in various ways, which I'm not going to go into. But the important part here is this, this, this would still be a valid gate if two conditions are met. One condition is that psi naught is, is indeed uh, 1 over the gate time. So this is the tuning, you know, the original tuning we're, we're used to from the original Walmer sorts and gate. And the other condition is that the sum over the ri squared, the condition over the geometric phase that you acquire is quadratic in the amplitude. So the sum of ri squared over ni equals 1. As long as these two conditions are met, you still have a valid gate. Um, and here is an example. So now we have a family of gates. They're all characterized by a series of ends, so the tones that you choose to use. Each of the tones is associated with an amplitude. And here are examples for three different gates. This is the n equal 1 is the original Walmer Sorensen gate. This, this is the circle here. But I can also drive a, a two-tone gate where instead of a single off-resonance frequency away from the side, then I have two of those. In this case, it's n equal one, n equal two, and I get this heart-shaped trajectory here, and I can play with a three-tone gate and get this funky green, green shape. All these are valid gates and will entangle your ions just the same. Turns out that if you write the time evolution operator, again, it'll look very similar. You'll have a, a spin displacement, so a momentum spin-dependent, momentum displacement, spin-dependent, uh, a position-dependent, spin-dependent position displacement, both are, are parameterized by functions g of t and f of t, and a geometric phase, uh, which is parameterized by the function a of t. Now that we have more degrees of freedom, we can try and use these degree of freedom. We have redundancy, so we can design these degree of freedom in order to robustify the gate. How do we do that? We can write, uh, find an analytic expression for the gate fidelity, um, uh, and it looks like this. So this is the gate fidelity after we finished running the gate. You can see that um, you know, the gate fidelity depends on f and g being 0 here, and a equals uh, um, pi over 2. In this case, this sum function would be 1. If f and g are equal 0, then these two exponents are 1. Um, and in this case, we get, uh, we get a fidelity. So if we sum the fractions here, we get a fidelity of 1. You'll notice the temperature here does not, as long as you're in the Lambiki regime, does not hurt your fidelity. But if your parameters are wrong, uh, not being in the ground state certainly amplifies your error. So temperature in the Lambiki regime does not cause error in itself. It amplifies errors if they do exist. It's, for example, timing errors. What we can do now is take this fidelity, expand it order by order in different parameters of the gate drive. So for example, the gate time, trap frequency, any parameter you'd like, you can expand this fidelity order by order, and now play with these extra degrees of freedom we have in order to kill these, or these, these errors order by order. Here is an example. What happens if you have an error in the gate timing? That means that instead of driving the correct time, you have some delta t. Turns out that the error you get goes as delta t over t to the power of 2n, where n is the number of tones you if you have the regular molmer sorensen gate, n equals 1, that means your error is quadratic in, in the time error that you have. If you use a two-tone gate, the error would, be, uh, would go like the time to the fourth time, which is a, a, better, a better gate. So for the n equal 2 solution, turns out, for n equal 2, turns out that the gate solution that kills the second order timing error is a solution where the tone of the first the, the amplitude of the first tone is equal minus the amplitude of the, of the second tone. 
This is the heart-shaped solution I've shown you before. This shape is called a cardioid. You get it by rolling a circle on top of another circle, and you get this, this nice heart-shaped heart solution. And when we use this solution and drive the gate, you can see that when we drive the regular molar Sorensen gate, the blue trajectory and phase space here, indeed the air, this is the population of the two ions. The red curve is the SS population, the blue curve, is, I'm sorry, the blue curve is the SS population, the red curve is the DD population, the yellow curve is the SD plus DS population. You see that errors in the gate time correspond to a quadratic error in the population. You would like a 50%, 50% population at the gate time. And when we use the cardio, we get a much flatter response around the gate time. This is the fourth order response. Um, turns out that this cardioid solution also kills carrier coupling uh, to the same level of, of uh, reduction. So here you see, again, a comparison between a molmor Sorensen gate and a cardioid gate, where on purpose we lower the trap frequency significantly, so offers of this carrier coupling would be significant. What you see here is the SD plus DS population at the first 2% of the gate time. And you see that when you drive molmor Sorensen, you get 2% amplitude population, meaning you have off-resonance carrier coupling that takes your population to the D level. That, this is an unwanted error. Whereas when we drive the cardioid gate, we cannot measure any, any population being transferred to the D level. So the same solution gets rid of timing error as well as, as, well as uh, off-resonance carrier coupling. The next error we set up to uh, null using this method is that of trap frequency errors. So there's a trap in nu, the trap frequency, and that's why we term these gates nuoid gates. Uh, turns out that when you expand the error order by order, uh, you cannot get rid of the or altogether. You're always left with a second order error in the trap frequency. However, this second order coefficient can be minimized. Okay? It cannot be taken to zero, but it can be significantly minimized. What you can get rid of order by order is the purity of the state after the gate is done, which means that what you can actually kill by adding more tones to your gate drive is the spin motion entanglement that you get left at the end of the gate. So there would not be any, any entanglement to spin in motion, which means you still get a pure state at the end. But you would not be able to optimize to optimize the phase to be pi over 2. So you'll still be left with a little bit of error. Uh, so this is data showing uh, the fidelity, so taken from both populations in parity, measurements of the gate. Uh, the molar Sorensen is the rate data here, simulation and data. You can see that you get second order um, error here around the correct trap frequency. By the way, you can see here that we scan the trap frequency, uh, the error in the trap frequency to half the, the correct component. So the, uh, the, the trap frequency varies by half the molar Sorensen detuning from the from the side net, which means you're almost you're almost hitting the side net. Uh, you can see that when we drive the both the cardioid and the nuoid gate, this is the yellow data here and the blue data here, we get almost flat response. So we're much better in terms of dealing with trap errors using these gates. So what what does the nuoid gate look like? You showed us the, the cardio. Uh, in phase space. Yeah. Um, so, I, 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 can, yeah, I, I, can sh I can go to the paper and show you the trajectory. It's not too fine in terms of its shape. Uh, both, by the way, you, you can see that, um, both, so if you look at the cardioid solution, you can see that it's closer to the origin. You don't go as further out as from the origin as you do in the molmor Sorensen, and that's why the amplitude of these yellow oscillations here is lower than the amplitude of the yellow oscillation. Here. And the more tones you get, you start closing trajectories, which sometimes go around the origin several times. If you go less further away from the origin than you would, all right. The next experiment I'd like to tell you about is that of uh, how to use dynamic cancellation of inhomogeneous electric quadruple shifts. Uh, yeah. Sorry, if we're related to these gates. The using more tones means only you use more laser power. Is this true? Or do you adjust That's it? That's true, or you, you, lose, you lose in time. So mm -hmm. there's a scaling you can, you can write that tells you how. But you are not limited by spontaneous emission, so this is. In this case, no. You're not limited by spontaneous emission. I mean, it's just because it's an optical, it's mm -hmm. an optical clock transition. Mm -hmm. so. 
Okay, the second experiment I'd like to describe is that of using dynamic decoupling in order to kill quadrupole shifts uh, on trapped ions. In particular, it's important when you use trapped ion crystals and the, the quadrupole shift is inhomogeneous. This is an experiment. Uh, the theory here, as well as the experiment theory, was developed, and the experiment was performed mainly by Ravid Shaniv, who's now a postdoc uh, at Gila. And related work was actually published uh, very uh, close to, to our publication. This was a collaboration between Alex Retzkill's group who did the theory and Peter Schwitz. Okay, so what is the motivation? The motivation is, is uh, mainly coming from the world of optical clocks. A recent uh, demonstration, I think the, the most accurate, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe the aluminum clock is similar uh, accuracy these days. Uh, but it's better? Yeah. Okay, but this, this is an example of a comparison of two Etruvian clocks by the group of Eckhart Pike um, at the PTB, which was able to show an accuracy and, and statistical uncertainty of 3 times 10 to the minus 18, which means 1 second in 10 to the 10 years, age of the universe or so. The caveat here is because you use a single ion, I think that is true also in the case of comparing two aluminum ions, projection noise is, is a problem. And you need to average in order to get rid of projection noise. In order to get to 10 to the minus 18, it requires 4,000 hours of average, which is a few months. You need to be very, very patient in order to get to the 10 to the minus 18 with a single ion. A straightforward solution is to use a crystal of 50 ions like the one we heard of from, uh, from Chris at the beginning of the conference. And since statistical noise would go down as the square root of n, you, you could get to the same statistical uncertainty hours, which, which would be great. The problem is that when you're using that many ions, you start getting inhomogeneous shifts. And two such inhomogeneous shifts would be due to the magnet, possible magnetic field gradients across the chain, which would shift the, the resonance frequencies of the ions. Another possible systematic shift is that of electric field gradients, which are inherent to ion traps. That's how we trap our ions, by applying electric field gradients across them. If there is any quadruple moment to the states which are involved in the clock transition, this electric field gradient will shift the clock, the clock frequency. So instead of having 50 identical clocks, you'll have 50 different clocks. So can we use dynamic techniques in order to null uh, these shifts? And the answer is yes. So for example, one way to null the first order Zeeman shift is to apply echo pulses. And we apply these echo pulses not in between the two clock states, but inside the manifolds of either the ground or the excited states. What you see here is data that was taken inside a Ramsey experiment, where the first pi over 2 pulse initialized the clock, optical clock superposition. A second pi over 2 plus measured that clock superposition. But in between, we implemented a series of micro pulses that flipped the state of the D level which is involved in the clock transition from a plus M level to a minus M level. In this case, the susceptib magnetic susceptibility of the optical superposition reversed its sign. Now, it reversed its sign, but it had a different magnitude, which means your echo pulses has to be placed such that the waiting times are not the same in the two states. But if the ratio of waiting times is equal to the ratio of magnetic susceptibilities, you can get rid of the first order of Zeeman effect. And what you see here is the Ramsey measurement that we get when we do that, we see that we kill magnetic field defacing and we're left with a Ramsey coherence time of about 10 milliseconds, which indicates that our laser line is about 15, 15 hertz. It's a, it's a bit tough or a bit more complicated to get rid of the, of the quadruple shift. So in the clock superposition, the ground state does not have any quadruple moment. It's spherically symmetric. It does have a Zeeman splitting. The excited state does have a quadruple moment. It's not spherically symmetric. It also has a Zeeman component to it. So we would like to use a, a dynamic decoupling sequence that would kill the quadruple, the quadruple shift of the excited state. How would you do that? So the intuition behind the cancellation goes as follows. So if I look at the Hamiltonian of the D-level manifold of my clock transition, it has a Zeeman term here. It has the quadruple shift Hamiltonian, it's a tensor shift, and that's why it looks like some prefactor. This is the quadruple uh, moment of the D level, and then J squared minus 3JZ squared. And that's a general way which you can write 
tensor shifts of, of atomic states. And this is my control field. In this case, I choose a JY, uh, a JY Hamilton. This is my dynamic coupling field. This is something I, this is free evolution. This is my control. So it's easy to see that this control field would get rid of the Zeeman shift. Right? That is because JZ and JY do not commute. JY would flip JZ from JZ to minus JZ, JZ minus JZ. So these two would cancel each other. How about the quadruple shift? So to see what JY does to the quadruple shift, it, it would make sense to write instead of JZ squared, write JZ squared <coughs> as JZ squared plus JX squared and JZ squared minus JX squared. Now notice that JZ squared plus JX squared is J, J squared minus JY squared. That is because JX squared, JY squared plus JZ squared squared and J squared. Maybe that was a bit fast. But anyways, this is really j squared minus jy squared. And that is why this Hamiltonian here commutes with jy. Okay. But the difference Hamiltonian does not commute with jy. That means jy would kill this term. And I can now write jy squared minus 3jz squared as simply j, j squared minus jz squared plus jx squared. Okay. So... This is what I get after an evolution under JY. The JZ squared was, was gone, and I can write this term as this. And now, in order to cancel the quadruple shift, all I need to do is add some free evolution, turn off this JY squared. I'll, I'll remain with a little bit of JZ squared, and I'll remain with JY squared minus 3JZ squared. Now, if you look at the sum of these two, if the wait time was 2 thirds and third, I can sum these two and get j squared minus the sum of jx squared, jy squared, and jz squared, which is really zero. Okay, this, this is the way I kill the quadruple shifts. So the experiment we did was run an optical Ramsey experiment without any cancellation to an optical, uh, to, a, to another clock transition investigation with cancellation. Two thirds of the time I apply my jy, one third of the time I do not, and I measure. Now, I want to kill the quadruple shift to the subhertz level, and the problem is I don't have subhertz resolution on my optical clock uh, transition. So in order to know that I'm actually doing what I'm hoping to do, um, instead of looking at the transition frequency of each of the ions, I'm comparing the transition frequency of the two ions. In other words, what we performed here was correlation spectroscopy. So if you perform a Ramsey experiment on two ions, these are the superpositions that we prepare. <coughs> But after Ramsey experiment, if we look, instead of looking at the probability of each of the ions being in the excited or ground state separately, I look at the correlation of both ions being in the even parity and odd parity states, I, I, I will actually get a signal which is proportional to the phase difference between the two ions. Okay? And the phase difference between the two ions is independent of the laser of the laser frequency. So I can perform, I can compare the oscillation frequency of the two ions with respect to each other with a resolution that is, that is subhertz relatively easy. These are the uh, results of the experiment. So here we put three ions with a magnetic field gradient uh, put on them okay, on purpose. Now if there is no quadruple shift, the frequency difference between ion one and two and the frequency difference between ion two and three would be the same simply because the gradient is, is highly linear. However, in the presence of a quadruple shift, the frequency difference between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 would not be the same. This is what you see here. This is without any quadruple shift cancellation. When we apply the quadruple shift cancellation sequence, we see that uh, both, both uh, frequencies are the same. I still have a little bit of magnetic field gradient. This is because of the one-third time free evolution that I have. Um, but the quadruple shift has been canceled at the 10 millihertz level, which is at the 10 to the minus 7. Uncertainty, uh, systematic uncertainty, and this is mainly limited by our, our measurement, not, not, not by the principle. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? Okay. So, in order to, um, I'm, I'm going to briefly go over the rest of the quadruple shift, so I'll have a little bit of time to speak about isotope shifts and connect to the next talk, uh, Vladan. Um, if we would like to get rid of this little bit of Zeeman shifts, we can apply these echo pulses uh, in the remaining one-third time of free evolution. And when we do that, I'm not going to 
go in detail through the data. This is a comparison across a, a, an ion chain of seven ions. You can see the frequency difference between different pairs of ions is, is different. And we can use this data in order to extract the, the magnetic field gradient across the chain as well as the quadrupole shift. But if we apply the full cancellation sequence, which includes pulses that get rid of Zeeman shifts, we see that all the pairs have zero frequency difference for measurement. So these sequences are actually very useful, we believe, in order to interrogate, perform optical puck interrogations of multi ion crystals. The last topic I'd like to uh, talk about is a recent measurement we performed in which the isotope shift uh, was measured with very high precision using a two isotope entangled state. This work was led by Tom Anowitz and, and Sam Akinawan. And actually, 20 minutes ago, Tom sent me an email that was accepted to PRL. So. Anyway, so what are isotope shifts? Um, and here I'll give an introduction a little bit to what Vladan would be talking about. The isotope shift is an isotope dependent change of the electron energy levels. When you change the number of neutrons, you change the mass of the isotope we move from one, one isotope to another. And what are the leading order contributions to the isotope shifts? Where there are two dominant contributions to the isotope shift. One comes from the difference in mass between the different isotopes. So for example, the reduced mass when you solve the atomic uh, uh, spectrum, you look at the electron and in, the, in the center of mass frame. The reduced mass in the center of mass frame depends on the mass of the nuclear. Okay, only a little bit, but it does. The second leading contribution is that of the, it's the field shift due to the fact that the, uh, the nucleus is not a point charge uh, a particle. It rather has a finite charge radius. And the uh, electronic wave function overlaps this uh, r equals 0 uh, nucleus. And that changes the energy uh, of the electron. Now, a spectroscopist by the name of uh, William King from the Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford in the 60s noticed that you could write these two contributions to a very good approximation in the following way. You can take, take any of these terms, both the mass shift and the field shift, and write them as a product of two contributions. One contribution only depends on the electronic wave function that, that you use, meaning it depends on the transition that you investigate. It does not depend on the isotope. For example, if you look at the field shift, then the F uh, prefactor here depends on the density of the electron on the nucleus. That, to a very good approximation, at least in first order approximation theory, does not depend on the mass of the nucleus. It only depends on the electronic wave function, on the transition used. Whereas the charge radius of, of, uh, of, uh, I, of, of the nucleus does not depend on the transition used. It only depends on the isotope that you use. And this factorization also holds to a very good approximation for the, for, the, uh, for the mass shift. And that means that if you now take this equation here and you divide by the difference in reduced masses, this is the dependence on the isotopes in the case of mass shift, you can write a normalized isotope shift as a sum of two electronic terms and only one term that depends, that depends on the nucleus. Okay? Now, if you take two such transitions, you can take this unknown quantity out and write one of these transition as a linear function of the other transition. And now if you plot these normalized isotope shifts with respect to each other along an isotope chain, you expect to see a highly linear relation. This is called the King plot. So in a collaboration with a, a, a group of high energy theorists at the Weizmann, we came up with a proposal that says that, look, what happens if you have a new force? You have a new force could be a scalar force that couples the electron to the nucleus, you'll have some interaction potential between the electron and the nucleus that would look like an Aikawa potential with a range that depends on the mass of this mediating boson. And in this case, you would have another term in the King relation that would bend, bend the King plot away from linearity. And in a later publication with uh, more collaborators, um, we're able to predict bounds that you could place on the existence of such new forces, such new physics, given an isotope shift comparison along an isotope chain of given different, different atomic species. Uh, among these are both neutrals as well as uh, ions. Ions are particularly uh, convenient for this measurement. With the data I'm showing here is a, a preliminary data coming from Mikkels, 
uh, lab, and, and you'll hear soon about uh, other data that was taken in, in Vladan's group. Uh, here, linearity was, was confirmed at the subkilohertz level. Subkilohertz level, or even, even 100 hertz or so. So even the kilohertz level on top of a gigahertz isotope shift, that means this line is linear at the tenth minus six. So we want to measure isotope shifts very accurately. Um, and how would you do that? We've measured the isotope shift between strontium-88 and strontium-86. It's a 570 megahertz isotope shift. And if you want to measure this with subhertz accuracy, that means we need to interrogate this clock transition at 10 to the minus 15 accuracy, which is very difficult. However, if you prepare an entangled superposition of one isotope being in the S and the other isotope in the B and vice versa, you'll notice that this superposition is it in the decoherence-free subspace because all its magnetic moments and quadrupole moments are almost identical, so magnetic field noise will not affect the superposition at all. In fact, the laser phase noise will not affect the superposition at all, but the superposition would evolve at the frequency difference between these two states, which is the isotope shift exactly, and the isotope shift only. So if you like, this is a synthetic RF atomic clock with the radio frequency, transition frequency, which equals the isotope shift. So this is the experiment we, um, we performed. We trapped the two ion crystal, strontium-88 and strontium-86, using sideband transition, so blue sideband and red sideband transition, prepared this entangled superposition, and measured the, the rate at which the superposition phase evolves as a function of time. In fact, don't need to entangle the ions in order to do that. Similar to the experiment I, I've shown before, it's enough to apply two carrier pi over two pulse pulses and look at the, at the correlation spectroscopy. Ions, the price you pay is a little bit less contrast than this. So, by performing this measurement, uh, we were able to measure the isotope shift between these two isotopes with about uh, 9 millihertz uh, uncertainty, uh, statistical and systematic being on par. Uh, that corresponds to a fractional frequency uncertainty of the isotope shift at 10 to the minus 11 which corresponds to an uncertainty on the full optical transition of about 10 to the minus 17. One thing we did not expect but did notice is that the isotope shift actually depend on both of the magnetic field and the M level that we used in the ground and excited state. And the reason for that is that the magnetic susceptibility of the D level does depend on the isotope that we use. Actually, it's a small effect. It's two parts in 10 to the minus 8, but it's very, it's very clear. And you can see here the frequency difference between these two superposition parts is a function of B times MB, highly linear. Okay, so uh, with that I would like to conclude uh, and thank all the hardworking uh, students and, and um, collaborators at the Trap Iron Group, thank our funding agencies and you for your Thank you very much, Tori. So Rui, with the with the multi-ion clock, um, you, you talked about Zeeman shifts and quadrupole shifts. You can also um, cancel those by averaging by appropriate averaging over M sublevels, right? Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you if you can keep track of each ion by itself and average over M sublevels ion by ion. Uh, do you get to use the whole chain? Is that another way to to eliminate those systematics? For sure. Um, with one, so one disadvantage you'll have is the fact that your laser, unless you have individual addressing, your laser frequency would be different. You know, as, uh, your detuning would be different to each and every ion. That could lead eventually maybe a little bit to, to imperfect high pulses. So I think that's a small overhead. The main overhead, in my opinion, is if you look at noises that could come up uh, with these. Um, these, these parameters, then when you know these things coherently, you do it much faster, which means they're robust. You're more, in terms of the spectrum of noises you're able to deal with, it's much larger than the spectrum of noises you're, you're able to deal with when you try to measure each ion separately and then average over different different networks. But you're right. I mean, you could do this without, you could average these errors out incoherently. You don't necessarily have to average them out coherently. So you, you had a nice
linear plot there, does that put any limits on interesting new physics? New, new physics? So what we did do, and Vladan would tell you about what they did, we, we, in order to place limits on new physics, what you need to do is to be able to plot, uh, to perform a king plot comparison. So a comparison of two isotope shifts, so two transitions across an isotope chain. What does it mean? It means you need to spectroscopically investigate two transitions. That's a little bit of work. But you also need at least four isotopes in order to get three isotope shift comparisons. Right? The three isotope shifts correspond to four isotopes. And all these isotopes need to have zero nuclear spin because the hyperfine interaction would complicate this simple uh, approximation, I think, significantly. And that means you need to use an atom that has four bosonic isotopes. Uh, Strontium plus, which is what we've been working for, unfortunately doesn't have stable four bosonic isotopes, and that's why we didn't do the full measurement uh, yet. Vladan used deuterium plus, which has many uh, stable uh, bosonic isotopes. Uh, Nico used calcium plus, which also has several uh, bosonic isotopes. Yeah. Time for one more. Yes, How far could I push your method? You are now at 10 millihertz or something. Can I do 1 millihertz? Can I do microhertz? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, both in terms of statistics. So if you look at the, at the uncertainty here, so the statistical uncertainty in our case was uh, 5 millihertz. The systematic uncertainty was 7 millihertz. Statistical uncertainty was simply due to our lack of patience. That was after about 24 hours of averaging. You know, you could, you could just wait longer and, and push that down. Uh, maybe 12 hours, it's less than 24. The seven um, millihertz systematic uncertainty was dominated by electric field gradient, uh, magnetic field gradients that were perpendicular to the twine crystal. What that happened was that um, any micromotion, any stray electric fields, when it pushes the ions away from the null of the RF, because the mass is a little bit different, they see a little bit of difference in the pseudo-potential, which means that the, the, the two-ion crystal tilts a little bit. And when it tilts, and if there is a magnetic field gradient perpendicular to your crystal, you get a little bit of a shift. So if you would, to repeat this measurement again, we would get rid of magnetic field gradients perpendicular to the crystal as well. We didn't think of it ahead of time. You can certainly do better. So I think wasn't your decoupling technique get rid of? So here there's no there's no decoupling. This is an entangled superposition. Okay. What we did in order to get a magnetic field gradient along the axial direction of the two ion crystal is to take data when the two ions are in, in inter, interleave data when the two ions flip their positions. That, however, did not get rid of, of magnetic field, the effect of magnetic field gradients, which were perpendicular to the time system. It took us about six months to figure that out. <laughs> okay, so thanks okay. again, Lori. And the uh, next and final talk of the meeting will be given by Hans Bladen. We are glad you made it. Right took a long way from Sorry, I have to teach this on the inside. And Flanagan will be talking about measurements of isotope shifts in deuterium stage for a dark mode. Thank you all for staying here till the end. Um, I'm excited to give this talk because this is the first time I talk about these new results. And unlike most other things that we do, where we kind of know what we expect, and if it doesn't work, we just try to make it better until it agrees with theory. Thank you. Here we have really no idea of um, what we will measure. Um, so let me start with... Um, one of the famous quotes from Arthur Schalow. He says, to do successful research, you don't need to know everything. You just need to know one thing that isn't known. And this particularly applies if it's something that nobody has a clue about. Okay? And what nobody really knows is the question of 
physics beyond the standard model of dark matter. Um, and Roy has already given a beautiful introduction. Um, Arthur Schauer also said, never measure anything but frequency. Um, I highly agree with him. So I'm changing my talk. So instead of generally searching for dark matter, we are using this proposal by Roy, uh, the seminal proposal by Roy and co-workers, and we are really measuring just frequency shifts uh, between isotopes searching for new bosons. And um, the work was done by um, my graduate student Ian Counts on the experimental side and June uh, on the more theory side, and we have had a nice, very nice collaboration with one of Jay's group and his graduate student Hongi Jian um, from Seoul. So the idea is to use for a fifth force, an unknown fundamental force for precision spectroscopy on optical transitions. Um, and I will present result to you on measurements of five bosonic isotopes in the terbium. We are lucky we have five isotopes of spin zero. It turns out to make these precision measurements, at least at our current level of understanding, you want to have spin zero uh, bosons. Um, and we are lucky to have five of those that we can trap and measure. We have done the measurement in two different um, D3 halves and D5 half quadruple transitions. Um, and I will tell you at the end a little bit about where we're going next to do also measurements on the octopole transition, which is very highly forbidden. It's, I think, the state with the longest known lifetime, uh, where we have also now found um, several transitions for several isotopes. And in principle, we could even add neutral atoms to the mix, because it turns out we can compare neutral atoms and ions as well, as long as the nucleus is the same. So here the question is, you know, the, we are measuring, we are trying to measure a fifth force made by a new boson. Um, and as Roy described, this is my picture, is if some new boson phi exists that can be exchanged that couples both to the neutron and the electron um, through some process, then it can be virtually exchanged between the two. Um, and this virtual exchange of this boson gives rise to a cover like potential, uh, which is an R1 over R potential with a cutoff, which is given by the Compton wavelength, meaning by the mass of phi. So basically, um, if this boson is very light, then um, its copper wavelength will lie outside the atom, and it uh, can definitely couple. If this boson is heavy, then its interaction range will be shorter and shorter. Um, and the original very nice idea, fortunately not realistic, but what got us excited in the first paper, Roy and co-workers proposed that you could even measure the Higgs boson that way. So in a non-standard article, like the Higgs boson in principle gives rise to this coupling. The problem of the Higgs boson is that it's so heavy that it's um, interaction range right, lies well within the nucleus, and therefore it's very difficult to distinguish it from regular contact forces between electrons and neutrons. But if it's in a reasonable mass range, you can measure it this way. So this is, um, Roy has already shown the uh, PRT reference. This is the follow-up paper in PRL, where they analyzed it um, in, um, more broadly for a variety of transitions. Um, so just to give you a basic idea where things stand, if you can measure isotope shifts at the level of 1 to 10 hertz or so, um, then you can basically probe coupling strengths and masses of these um, non-standard model particles that have not been probed before by any other technique, maybe even as much as 100 hertz. So the idea is, uh, and Roche showed this nice pictures, these transitions are shifted due to, um, for different isotopes, due to the mass shift and the field shift. Uh, of course, we work with heavy ions, many electrons, <coughs> but you can't really compare directly to theory. The ideal situation would be, you know, you do the theory, you do the comparison of the experiment, and then you uh, find out whether it's an extra force. Um, and as um, we will, I will remind you once again, um, you can sidestep this necessity of comparing the theory that you can't calculate by comparing different isotope shifts. So let me go through in a little bit more detail. Um, you have seen two of these terms. Thank you, Rory, for the very nice introduction. So this is um, the frequency shift between two isotopes, a reference isotope and isotope J on some transition alpha. Um, and I've ordered here the terms um, in terms of importance. This is the field shift that Roy discussed. So this is basically the size of the nucleus, which is independent of the electronic transition times the electronic wave function, which is independent of the isotope. So the electronic wave function depends on the transition. This is actually a fact that depends on both wave functions in the ground state and the excited state. Um, that's labeled by alpha, and this is the uh, nuclear term. This is the field shift, 
Uh, the second next term of importance is the inverse mass shift. It's basically the reduced mass of the electron that depends on the mass of the nucleus. Again, this is the mass difference of the, the inverse mass difference of the nuclei, and this is an electronic factor. Um, these two terms give rise to, to a, a linearity. For us, this term is about a few percent. The mass shift is much smaller than the field shift. This is the dominant term. For the heavy ions, it's about a few percent. Uh, for calcium, for the lighter ions, uh, it can be the other way around. So these are the dominant terms. And then here I have written down what we calculate to be the next order nonlinear term within the standard model. Um, and this is basically the shape of the nucleus. So if you imagine keeping the nuclear size fixed by changing the shape of the nucleus, you get a slight nonlinearity. Um, and basically this term here couples to the probability of finding the electron at the origin. This term here couples with the curvature of the wave function squared at the origin, the curvature of the density distribution because it senses the shape. Um, and for us, to give you an idea, this is around 10 to the minus 6 in difference frequency of the different functions. So this is a small term. And then I added here tentatively what the term would look like if we had dark matter. Um, we know, we expect, so in this model, dark matter is coupled to the neutron and to the electrons. So it would be proportional to the neutron number difference between the two isotopes that you're comparing that I've labeled by delta AJ, then you can have some, put in some dimensions, coupling strength, it kind of characterizes this fundamental force, and then again you have a wave function factor, uh, which is basically um, taking into account that you're coupling from some ground to some excited state, um, gives you some kind of small shift. So these two first terms give a linear shift. These terms in general will give a deviation from nonlinearity, uh, from linearity, unless there's a Fortuitous, or I would say unfortuitous, uh, unhappy coincidence where somehow if this happened to be proportional to that exactly, right, then you couldn't distinguish it because it would look linear, but it's very unlikely to happen. Um, that would be just have to be a coincidence. So, as I said, you can't calculate this, and this is a large term. Um, so, this is basically Gigerhertz isotope shift. So, to get rid of it, you take two transitions, write down two equations, and then eliminate this term. And it turns out that this term is also eliminated. So if you now take the transition frequency and divide it by the mass difference, basically you take this equation, you divide, divide by this mass difference, every term by the mass difference between the photons, and between the, sorry, between the nuclei, and then you rearrange, then you can write the transition frequency, the normalized to the mass shift, on some transition beta as a linear function of the same normalized transition frequency on some transition alpha. This is what Roy was showing with some coefficient in front. The mass shift, gives you now an offset to this line. For this, for us, as I said, this is very small. And these coefficients are basically differences, and scale differences of the, trans of the coefficients that you saw before in the previous slide in two different transitions. So this is the linear dependence. And then you can similarly divide this change in shape, this fourth moment of the nuclear size by the mass difference. And you get a nonlinear term here, and potentially a nonlinear term for the new boson like so. And as we already pointed out, you need at least four spinless isotopes to measure the nonlinearity because you need three data points to have a nonlinearity. Uh, if you use spin, you have higher order hyperfine interaction, which by itself might be interesting, as I've learned recently. So maybe one can add fermions to it, but one has to think very carefully. Typically, um, the fermions deviate from this line. So, for instance, for us, I will show you, we see some nonlinearities at the kilohertz level, the fermion nonlinearities at the megahertz level due to this hyperfine shift. So maybe fermions can be included. But in terms of we are very lucky because we have not four but five isotopes. One of them is quite rare, 0.1% so abundance, and it's the same term, but we can track, uh, track it in the ion track. Um, and so we have measured now two transitions. These are the two D levels of the terbium, 2D3 half and 2D5 half at 4.11 and 4.13 mark 5 nanometers respectively. We um, generate this light from a Thai Seth laser at 870 nanometers and 832 nanometers <coughs> with a frequency double in the waveguide to get a few milliwatts of light um, that we focus on, on the ions in the ion trap, on a single ion in the ion trap. Um, and if we do that, we get um, this kind of king plot. Here's basically the units are now frequency shift divided by this inverse mass difference. So the units are hertz times uh, atomic mass. Um, and so you get a very nice uh, linear relationship between the two transitions. The slope here is 0.93 or so. Um, in the 90% level, the slopes are pretty similar. The reason is that the D levels are pretty similar, right? 
Um, if this was a non-relativistic single atom transition, then these E levels would actually be the same. <coughs> it would have a slope of one, and it would also have no sensitivity to any, any physics beyond the standard model. So these levels need to be different, because essentially what you're doing is you're saying there's this extra Yukawa potential, and I'm trying to probe it, so I need two different transitions to probe it. The S level here is common, so these have to be different. In the turbulent, we are lucky because it's so heavy. Actually, when you change the outer electron, you also change the distribution near the nucleus. Again, you're using the same action, so this state gives you no, um, gives you no, um, signi uh, no signal, essentially. If you just took the D state, the D state we all learn has no probability to be found near the nucleus. You wouldn't expect anything else either. <coughs> this D state leads to reconfiguration of the inner electrons by a little bit, which changes the density of the origin. And so basically, when they excite here to or there, you get um, some change of the electron density as the origin, at the origin, which can give rise to the nonlinearity. Um, if we use different transitions, which we'll use in the future, we can get about 10 or 20 times more sensitive than comparing these two. So these are not ideal, but they are pretty good, and they are easy to measure. Um, now let's talk a little bit about this plot. Roy showed it. This is from their paper. I showed it um, very briefly, but we didn't quite discuss it. Um, so what typically is plotted is on a logarithmic scale, because we have no idea where the particle could lie. This is the mass, in this case in electron volts, of the, of the particle. Um, and this is the dimensionless coupling strength um, from particle physics theory. Um, there are various curves over here. So basically, let me show it maybe, there are kind of two interesting regimes. So if the mediator mass is, of this boson is less than about 100 keV, that means that the Compton wavelength is bigger than the atom. In this case, you get a constant sensitivity to, to any fifth force, because basically it doesn't matter what the range of the bar of the forces anymore. If your mass is above 100 keV, um, but less than, um, less than some other range, basically now the, now the potential is smaller than the atom. And if the Coulomb, sorry, if the Compton wavelength gets very small, the potential is very short range, and you get less and less sensitive to it. And roughly here is where the force radius, this Compton wavelength, is less than the nuclear size, and there you really lose <coughs> sensitivity. So basically here, um, you lose sensitivity for the, heavier, uh, for the heavier masses because it's more and more difficult to measure something very close to the nucleus. Um, these are here different curves. I believe the calcium curves are not correct. Um, these sensitivities are overrated, basically because in calcium, which is light, they, the 2D levels are so similar that there's a lot of cancellation going on in the sensitivity. Um, we have redone the calculations for a terbium, and we roughly agree uh, with this calculation, so we believe that uh, the, the terbium curves are right as well as the strontium, strontium curves. Um, the excluded regions are this blue region, so there are fifth force measurements and particle physics, which kind of exclude everything below 100 dB or so, 100 electron volt for the mass of the particle uh, very well. And then this region is excluded by neutron scattering experiments where people understand the scattering of neutrons of, uh, of nuclei and G minus two experiments of the electron. Although near this boundary, there may be some model dependence actually. It's not fully clear to me whether these are you know, the first principle bounds, bounds when you include the model. Um, there are some astrophysical uh, or astrophysical observations which are supposed to exclude these regions down here, uh, they are model dependent and they are actually interesting in the sense that usually you know you can exclude strong coupling but not weak coupling. The astrophysical bounds are actually opposite. They exclude weak coupling but not strong coupling. And the reason is that if the coupling was too weak, then these particles could escape and take a lot of energy with them. And because you know the energy is not has not left, that gives you an upper bound. Um, not the lower bound on, on the coupling. But these are model dependent, so it's certainly interesting to um, kind of measure these things in the laboratory. Um, so what this plot shows you is that at, at the one hertz level, where we are not yet, you can kind of you know, really explore new territory. The thing that really started us thinking about this and doing this experiment is, is if you could do this at one hertz, you see this gray uh, point here. This is the so-called beryllium or Tomke anomaly. Um, this was an interesting uh, nuclear physics experiment. It was a search for dark photons performed in, um, in a nuclear reactor in, um, uh, in Hungary. Um, so what they did is they bombarded lithium nuclei with protons and created excited state beryllium in this process. 
Um, and this is an unusual excited state in that for nuclear physics it has a relatively high excitation energy of about 18 MeV or so. Um, and it's known that this state decays via electron positron uh, emission. And um, so in general you would expect these electron positron pairs to be emitted back to back. However, for this particular transition, they observed an open aiming angle of 140 degrees. And I looked at the data paper, you know, the data really stands out. It's a six sigma deviation that really stands out. You know, by naked eye, you can see that there's something going on there. Um, so you clearly see this angle dependence. They also show that this angle dependence happens only at a particular energy, around 70 MeV. And the standard particle physics description is that you have an unknown particle that flies off in a certain direction first, that then decays into E plus, E minus. Um, and then you get this opening angle that is smaller because it's determined by this initial particle. And because you know they could measure the mass and so on, they can say you know if this is this unknown particle, it would have an energy or, or mass of 17 MeV. Um, when I talk to my nuclear physics colleagues, they don't quite believe these results. Um, they, I think, the group has not you know, has had some other announcements in the past. Um, but on the other hand, nobody can point to an error. In this experiment. It's really a relatively simple experiment. They create beryllium and then they measure electrons and positrons as a function of direction. So nobody has told me, oh, we think that you know, this is wrong or that is wrong. So it's, it's, a, it's a curious result. Um, and so basically, you know, we thought we would like to you know, most likely exclude, exclude this result by precision measurement. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the situation. Um, the way we measure things, uh, I think, Roy has described it for strontium. It's, it's pretty similar. We have you know ions in the ground state. We do fluorescent detection. We try to drive this transition, and then if the ion went either to the long the D5 half states or the D3 half state, depending on which state we are probing, then the fluorescence turns off. So it's really a quantum jump technique. Um, and um, we can measure it for these five bosonic isotopes, and we did from range from 168 terbium to 176 terbium on these two different transitions. Um, we perform Ramsey spectroscopy with shelving. This is an example of, of Ramsey fringes on, on one of the transitions. Um, and another Charlotte Lotus, he says, always measure twice, once quick and dirty, and the second time the best you can. Today, I only have the quick and dirty for you. <laughs> Roy, I think the best you can kind of experiment. <coughs> However, it turns out that the quick and dirty already re seems to reveal something. Um, so, um, in, in this case, our goal was to just kind of quickly see where we are, um, and we have some results from this. Um, so, our data are really quick and dirty in the sense that we are not doing anything fancy like the Roy's group does, where they co track two isotopes and as we measure simultaneously, we do the simplest we can do. We track one ion, we measure the Francis spectroscopy for half an hour. We then switch to the other. So this is, for instance, 170, 170 versus 174. We measure this data point here. Then we switch to the other one. We measure this data point for half an hour. We switch back and forth um, roughly every 20 to 30 minutes. And we collect about 40 data points. And we see a linear drift. This is basically our reference cavity. We have this high Ceph laser locked to ultra low expansion reference cavity. And it keeps drifting. And on top of that, we see deviations that are bigger than our statistical errors. And we think that this is just our lock is not perfectly good. We have some so-called residual amplitude modulation, which leads to an offset in the error signal. On the, we haven't just fixed this yet. So we see typical fluctuations of maybe around the kilohertz or so uh, away from this linear drift. But we just measure, um, make many of these averages uh, once against the other. Um, and if we do that, um, this work. Okay, so this is the plot that I've shown you. This is the Dirac King plot. If we zoom in by a factor of a million, so we zoom into these points by a factor of a million, so the way I'm displaying it here is I'm breaking this axis. So here we have a range of plus minus 10 um, times 10 to the 6 in these units hertz times the atomic mass. And then you should think about, you know, this axis is broken by a million, and then comes the next piece here. Um, and here, um, this is for the 411 transition, same thing. Um, and so these are our current uh, data. Um, so, okay. um, so these are preliminary data. We are still analyzing error bars. Um, this is just to give you an idea where our experiment results will lie. 
I think will come out somewhere between two and three sigma of non-linearity at the moment. So we see that the data points do not agree with this linearity line. Um, and we see that typically each point is one, one and a half sigma off, so we'll end up somewhere between two and three sigma uh, for the total non-linearity. Um, so these are different pairs. This is the pair involving the rarest isotope, 168. Um, here it has a, a strange error bar, um, and that's because this isotope, its mass measurement is about a factor 10 worse than the other mass measurements. So the mass enters as well as the frequency. Um, fortunately for us, um, basically the mass measurement, because the mass is divided on both sides of the isotope shift, it's almost parallel. This mass uncertainty was almost parallel to this line. So it doesn't come up, come in very much, even though it's a large, large error bar for this kind of measurement. Um, however, um, in the future, when we go down, these are measurements of about these uncertainties and frequency units are about 300 hertz, and a typical deviation from this line is about 1 kilohertz, um, what you see here in the frequency unit. However, when we go down to 10 hertz or below, at that point, we will need to know the mass is better. Um, and so we are also trying to um, get Klaus Blaum uh, to see whether they can do better. Because in principle, mass measurements. This mass measurement could certainly be done 10 factor 10 better. Even this could probably be better. Nobody has really cared to know the turbulent mass so accurately, but now we have a, we have a reason for this. Um, so we can um, we measure this line, the slope of this line. We have also our weight functions where we can predict the slope of this line, and we can predict it to about a few percent in our calculations. We can use um, available software factors for this. Um, so basically this is the equation that I've showed you before. This is the linear dependence that we see. And then presumably one of these terms, presumably this one, but we don't really know, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a long enough term. Um, and you could ask him, what, you know, let's say that we confirm this nonlinearity, what beyond it can you do um, to analyze where it's coming from? Um, and the nice thing is that we have, sorry, this should say we have five isotopes or four isotope pairs to measure the nonlinearity. So the minimum is three pairs. With four pairs, we can distinguish not only the magnitude, but we can also distinguish the pattern. And so what I mean by that is the nonlinearity could have this zigzag form that we have now, mostly. But it could be also curved nonlinearity, where, say, one point lies above, then two points in the middle lie below, and these lie above. And these are two independent ways of, of having nonlinearity. And the sum of these two terms is really the total nonlinearity, but we have also a pattern to look at. So we can um, look at this pattern. So basically, we define. Um, this is already okay. I told you this is preliminary, so um, don't quote me on this data. But I wanted to show you where we are. So now we can look at this deviation of this point from the line in the vertical direction, this direction. I actually am looking this direction. I drew it wrong. Um, and then we can make a linear combination of these. So for instance, the zigzag nonlinearity would be. The distance, positive or negative, 168 minus the distance of 170 plus the distance of 172 minus the distance of 174. That would want to quantify the zigzag nonlinearity. And on the other hand, 168 minus 170 minus 172 plus 174 would quantify the, um, the curve nonlinearity. And these can have both signs depending on whether the data points lie above or below the signs. Um, so we can analyze things this way. So we can do a plot where we um, on one axis plot the zigzag nonlinearity, this is this axis, and on the other axis plot the curve nonlinearity. Um, and in principle, because we know what the dark matter term looks like, if I show you the sorry about that, if I show you this equation, we know how the dark matter tail scales because it's simply proportional to the neutron number and we know the masses and so on. So we can in principle predict if it's dark matter where in this plane it should lie. Basically, if it's dark matter, there's a fixed ratio of zigzag nonlinearity and curve nonlinearity, and when we calculate for the pairs that we're analyzing, the dark matter would have to lie along this line in the graph. Um, if you have the standard model delta r to the 4, leading term nonlinearity, then in principle it can lie anywhere in this plane. It's just given by you know, the shape of the nuclei for the various isotopes and so on. Uh, we are now working with some uh, nuclear uh, calculation people who can, in principle, calculate these. Um, and for other isotopes, where also measurements have been performed of delta R to the 4, um, other species this can be measured directly via electron scattering. For instance, these calculations work very well, but we don't know for, uh, for 
uh, the turbulent, how well they work, but in principle, this term could be measured independently. Um, I should say we have evaluated what we think the next order terms are, so this is the shape term in the standard model. Um, we evaluate its magnitude to be less than what we observe. We expect this to be about 100 hertz, but it depends on the wave function in front of here. The next order term is a second order shift. Roy described it very briefly. So here you're assuming that the wave function is isotope independent and just the nuclear size changes and you evaluate you know, the interaction with the change nuclear size of the old wave function. Another next order term is the change of the wave function of isotope that then interacts with the nucleus. Um, we can calculate that term, we think that it's about a factor between 10 and 100 smaller than this term. <coughs> and the next term after that that we leave enters is the so-called polarizability of the nucleus. It's something that nuclear physicists would love to measure. It's the fact that the nucleus can actually change in the electric field um, produced by the electron. Um, and that term should be at the 1 hertz level or so. Um, so this is where currently, and again, don't quote me on this, this, this data point will move and the error bars will probably adjust a little bit, but roughly speaking, this is where, where our measurement in non inherity currently lies. Um, if you had pure um, dark matter nonlinearity, you would expect to zoom in on this line somewhere, depending on, on the strength of the nonlinearity. Um, if you had pure delta out of the four nonlinearity, it could be anywhere in this plane, um, and you don't know which unless you know uh, the, the shape of the nucleus. If you had both effects at the same time and of similar magnitude, then basically it would be a vector sum of both effects because it's a sum of both effects. So you would have some displacement in this plane from the delta R to the four term and then some other displacement from the dark matter term. If I take, I didn't dare to put this point in, but if I dare take the calculations of the nuclear fourth order moments uh, from, this, uh, from this German group, um, it's predicted to be somewhere here. Um, but um, that one has to be a little bit cautious. For that, also things will lie on a line. So let's assume that you knew this here. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, so if you, if you knew this term from nuclear physics calculations, um, there's still this electronic wave function. Um, and this term has a large uncertainty. And the reason is that this is uh, basically a difference between two different transitions, which are pretty similar. So there's a cancellation of these two terms. Um, and it should work to very high order. We predict a cancellation below 10 to the minus 3. But then we are not really sure about it. And this is, you, know, you need much, much better calculations to be sure that the two terms that you calculate, which we calculate at the moment just with percent precision, we, we know that absolutely calculate the percent precision. We think that many things are common mode because these delta levels are so similar, so the cancellation is probably much better than percent. But it's very hard for us to evaluate how good this cancellation is. So basically, if you knew these terms, but you didn't know this term over here, then in this theta plus minus plot, you would lie again on a line through the origin, which would be determined by the, the, these charge fourth order moments, and then some unknown factor in the wave on the wave function. So, Vlad, and the the G factor is, is, is the difference between the electric field gradient <coughs> that the electron applies on the nucleus between the different D orbitals. The G is the curvature of the wave function divided by the wave, sorry, the, cur the curvature of the wave function squared divided by the wave function at the origin and the difference between the two T levels. So each of these R to the four terms is the curvature of the wave function divided by the wave function at the origin, it turns out and then you're subtracting um, the two terms from the two different transitions. Um, so they are, <coughs> you know, they should be highly similar and so on, but again, we don't know um, where our um, results are. So what can we do in the future? Well, no matter whether it's dark matter or something else, if you go to a different transition, this term should stay the same, this term should stay the same. All that should change is these electronic wave functions in front. So right now, we are trying to do measurements on the F level. On the F level, you have much less of a cancellation. So both of these terms would I expect to be 10 to 20 times larger because you have more different wave functions, therefore more sensitive. So our prediction here is that if we, with the new F level data, redo this plot, this data point will lie 10 or 20 times further out, no matter what the origin is. 
that's that's our prediction to lowest order. Uh, in which case, you know, even the 300 hertz that we have right now will be more than sufficient, you know, to see a nonlinearity by any signal. On the other hand, you know, if, if this is a problem because the effect will be you know, 10 or 20 times larger, you know, we both clearly see or not see a nonlinearity. You know, maybe the other point will you know, lie and be more consistent with zero. So with the F levels, we can we can test this much better. Um, in principle, there might be a small difference on different transitions. Again, if I go back to this graph, if G alpha, beta, and D alpha, beta scale the same way, and they do mostly, right, because this is the curvature of the wave function at the origin, this is something also close to the nucleus if the particle is heavy. So if the particle is heavy, these two terms will scale the same way, and you will just get a scaled plot. On the other hand, if the particle is light, then this term will be different for different transitions, where this term will be just the wave function at the origin or the curvature of the wave function at the origin. In this case, the point will move in the zeta plus minus plane. So if you, if you have just one effect, this will be just a scaled version further out for the F levels. If you have two effects at the same time, this point will move somewhere else. Um, that would be kind of the best situation if they have different dependencies, because then by measuring many enough different orbitals, you can actually nail down the range of any extra, extra force term. So what are we planning to do? Um, we are planning, we have a measurement of F7 half on the way right now. Um, we have, you know, one isotope was known from, from literature. We have found that relatively quickly with a wave meter. We had to search quite a while to find the other isotope. This is a nanohertz, 100 nanohertz or so transition with a lifetime of um, several years. We have found the second isotope, and then it was very quick to find the third one because we used the narrative of the king plot that holds at you know, 10 to minus 6 and so on. Um, so right now we have found all the transitions, and kind of every, um, every pair takes us about two days to measure. So I'm very excited that within the next two weeks we have some preliminary results on, 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 these, on these F states. Here, we don't have enough Rabi frequency to do Ramsey plotting because the transition is so weak. We just see a Lorentzian line where we look at the line center. Again, we have something on the order of 10 or 20 kilohertz line width uh, similar to the Ramsey. So we, we hope we will see um, that you know, here the sensitivity will be magnified by a factor 10 or so. And then depending on the outcome, we think we will go back to the D levels. And now instead of measuring with 300 hertz resolution, measure maybe with 10 hertz resolution or so. To really nail really down if there's any nonlinearity. After that, depending on the outcome again, what we see and so on, it might be nice to follow up with neutral turbium. It turns out that you can also make a king plot where one axis is a neutral transition and the other axis is an ion transition, and that's because the nucleus is the same. So you really don't care whether the wave function of the electron has you know, whatever, 98 or what is it? Don't I forget now. What is it? Z equals 70, maybe 70 elements or 71 elements, it doesn't matter. So um, we have also a neutral atom clock experiment, so one could, for instance, measure the isotope shift on the clock transition for neutral turbine for these bosonic isotopes, and then generate another plot. That one will actually have the largest sensitivity because, let's see, yeah, in this plot here. So here we are basically measuring S to D, so S is common. Here we're using the difference in D. When we measure S to F, then the S is still common, but the F states, you measure F versus D, so you get quite a bit of a difference. But the biggest difference is, of course, if you have two different S states. So the neutral atom has a different S state than the ion, and then you get the maximum sensitivity. So you get another factor, two or three, in sensitivity from comparing neutral, uh, neutral to ion. Um, and so um, we will see what we get. At the moment, we are not looking at the data. We are just measuring them. We are not analyzing them to make, a, to make it maximally dark. I mean, we look at the megahertz level to know where to find the line, but then we don't look at the kilohertz level, but we expect um, these deviations. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sarah, for a very fresh and recent news, so we have some time for questions. So, Vlad, your, your measurement, you said you measure an isotope pair. And then half an hour later, another isotope pair, and the flywheel in between is the block to the cavity, which is drifting linearly, but you know the linear slope well enough to nail things down. At the right. Very good. So the problem is not the linear slope. That's very constant. The problem is this scatter around the linear slope. And that, we believe, comes with the pound river hallock. Um, and we believe that the arrow drifts a little bit. The cavity line is about 30 kilohertz. 
and you know we have a few percent of trips because we haven't done some of the tricks that people do in optical clocks, which is the so-called for the experts RAM stabilization, residual amplitude modulation, um, which you can do. To the next. So the problem is not the linear drift so much; it's the yeah. fact that these points. And then you can get a dick effect if you like of sampling that oscillation at different times. Right, at different times. So this is really about how data look like. You know, we measure this point, then that point, this point, then that point. So this is kind of one day, and I believe these are 12 hours or so. Then this is another day, um, and then this is like that. So you know, you could obviously do it much better using some of your techniques. I just have a naive question. I mean, the fact that the f wave function would be much larger than the d wave function. Uh, my, intuitively, you, say, you, you would say that the electron is less close to the nuclei, so then it is a bit hard to, to integrate that you, it would be a better right. measurement. So, I, I so it's, it's not a single electron transition. The yeah. charging is so heavy yeah. that if you take an electron to the F state, everything else rearranges okay. at the 10% level or so. Right. It's, it's really a big effect. You know, we have these calculations where you can do So basically, the fact that you put a you're right, if it was a one electron transition, we would have no sensitivity even for the D state, right? Because the scale so yeah, is L R to the L to the plus one density near the origin. So it's really the fact that we have a many electron atom and that when you change the orbital, everything changes, including the density of the origin. Uh, but that's why we get another factor when we compare the neutral to the terbium version, which have different S states, and they are really removing one atom from the S state into the biggest state. But it's surprisingly large. I don't have to think I have a plot in here. Um, so you, you know, you're surprised, but it's simply not the same. Yeah. Yeah, the, the F state is a hole, right? I mean, right. it's not even it's, it's, it's a hole, a hole from the core, yes, from yes. the core to the S. Right. And so it's different. I mean, that's true for S to D as well in some sense, right? But then somehow, you know, it's more of a hole for the F. So for instance, in um, and we have measured this actually, you predict, the calculations predict that this slope for the F level is actually negative. And that's because you're taking the electron out. So in one case, you're increasing the density near the origin. For the other transition, you're actually decreasing the density near the origin. This is not the core F electron. It's the no, no, but you're exciting. Yeah, it's not neither is core. You're exciting an S. S to, S, S to the F, right? But everything gets gets rearranged. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we would love to have help. My student does it at the moment, but we would love to have help from people who can really very well calculate um, electronic wave functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to? I don't know whether the the octopole transition has been observed yet. Um, maybe it has, but can you expect the same frequency error around 300 hertz? With the octopus, so it's such a weak transition, I would think the error would be larger. Um, yes, uh, we have, uh, so first of all, it has been observed. I think the first uh, PTB it has observed in two or three places for one okay. isotope. Uh -huh. PTB was the first that one. Was Pikes it. Group. Hmm? That was Pikes group. That was Pikes group, right? And then we had a follow up measurement. Um, they can already, you know, I think they can even do Ramsey. We are doing the simple, yeah, we don't have enough Rabi frequency to do Ramsey, but we very clearly see the line. And the line width of the line is similar to the width of our Ramsey fringes. It's on the order of 10 kilohertz given our laser line width. So if you have you know, 10 milliwatt or 20 milliwatt of blue light and you focus it down to a few microns squared onto the line, you can get, you know, kind of you can saturate the, the transition in about 100 milliseconds or so. These are all conditions. And all the lines that we see, the line widths, are 10 or 20 kilohertz. We haven't looked at the scatter yet because we wanted to keep it ourselves ignorant of what is going on. So I expect very much similar to the thing here um, because if the scatter is just given by the laser, it will not be a different. But we will see. You have to be careful. So whether you have zigzag or curve depends very much on how you plot the data. So here we have to plot the data versus next neighbors. So usually the simplest way to think about it is to plot it against the reference isotope. And then you get a different. So this plane looks very different. 
It also depends on which isotope you choose, actually. Right. So even if you use the reference isotope, that has to do with the fact that the reduced mass is not a linear function, but has a little bit of structure in it. And so, so basically, this depends on what you do. Here, we do next neighbors for practical reasons. It gives us the largest nonlinearity in sigma. And it kind of makes sense, because we measure next neighbors. So if our reference is, say, 174, and we want you know, to plot 174 versus 168, we accumulate all the errors in between. Right? If you plot it against next neighbors, we directly measure it. Um, we did also a direct check. So we measured, for instance, 170, 172, and then 170 to 174. We can also do a direct measurement 170 versus 174, and we find the same result in our error bar. But um, you know, I don't have the, the, the graph. I can show you. So if we plot it against the other reference, um, then it actually both terms are the same. So. In this plot, if you plot it against one reference, the dark matter line is actually in this direction. It's approximately at 45 degrees. Uh, so plot it against the reference isotope. Both nonlinearities are the same order. And I have to, I would like to understand a little bit better what this term is going on. So if the connection to the dark matter aspect, if to, to this boson field, mean that the electron mass would be defined, or how would I, uh, would I see it? Um, I'm reading not the next. So I presume that any coupling you know, would enter into the electron mass give you, to give you the observed mass. I think that would be a higher order effect, right? It's yeah, it's a, weak, it's a weak coupling, so there, yeah, there would be a correction. When you talk to particle physicists, the thing I managed to understand, if the coupling is this weak, they think it's probably not a first order coupling, right? Because why would it be so weak? They think it's probably a higher order effective coupling, right? So it could be a second order strong coupling with something off shell that then gives you this coupling that looks weak. Um, but that's really the extent um, of my understanding. Um, but. Um, yeah, I have one more plot that I didn't show you. It actually turns out that um, another place where the standard model is stretched is the G minus 2 measurement of the muon. That one disagrees with 3 and a half sigma from, um, from calculations. Um, that one is being remeasured, but it turns out that if you this plot <coughs> and this kind of plot you put what, what would follow if the G minus 2 was really different from the calculation, you get a line, a preferred line that lines, lies up here. And it actually touches the atomic bit anomaly. So if this measurement is confirmed, that there's some kind of measurement of Fermi lab going on, which confirms the G minus 2 of the muon, then there will be kind of two effects that do intersect somewhere above here, which are both at disagree with the standard model. Now you have to be extremely lucky, but you know, in, in dark matter usually you have no clue whatsoever. <laughs> Here at least you have some clues that you can exclude, right? Um. I was wondering if you would have uh, an atom with uh, an open shell uh, uh, electronic cloud, like uh, you know, uh, lanthanides, like erbium plus or something like mm -hmm. this. I don't know if they have enough uh, bosonic uh, isotopes by heart. I just wonder if this anisotropy would kind of enhance this effect because the you know the rearrangement of the of the of the electron wave function would be different. I, I just wonder if this anisotropy would kind of yeah. Uh, I, I believe so. So qualitatively, you want the biggest yeah. difference in transitions, and qualitatively, you also want the heaviest. Atoms, yeah. because you can see kind of your strontium, your terbium, calcium is up there. So in general, also the light atoms have a problem because they are, it turns out the mass uncertainty is a bigger problem. And I'm not sure what at what level the you know even if you measure perfectly, Michael, at what level the mass uncertainty uh, would set. So something like erbium, heavy, yeah, it's many heavy, electron, but also atoms. Is, uh, if the anisotropy that you have uh, inherently in the F shell open open F shell, if you would kind of maximize, because in a way it is not, I cannot imagine that if you have some kind of 
a spherical average of this effect of the electronic wave function. If suddenly it is anisotropic, maybe there is extra influence. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you, can, you could certainly measure extra effects coming from the anisotropy. That's very good. So I would say I think it's an interesting direction to look, look into. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good time to close the session so we still have lunch and time afterwards. So let's first thank Clara. And then I really want to thank like all of you, like the speakers of this session and of the whole um, of the whole workshop since Monday for the for the fantastic talks and really making this work. So As you can tell, my voice is kind of fading, so I won't say too much, which is, which is probably not a bad thing. So, uh, so just like one important point I would like to make is that sort of, like, I guess Mikhail agrees, so like he and, and me, we are labeled, somehow we carry the label as organizers of this conference, so that you can probably guess. So it's really like a, the work and the important organization has been done by, by Hussein and in particular by Naomi. And I would like to thank like both of them. Just two more, two more sentences. So this was also mentioned, I think, on Monday and by, by Chris in the very beginning. So what I really like about these item workshops, and most of us are not here the first time, that they usually bring together like a, a small group, but a very like select and focus group of, of, of experts. So this really generates like a nice atmosphere in, in terms of really giving a workshop in the two sense. And, uh, really, and I hope really that this also has worked out um, for this, um, for that workshop here. And with that being said, so I should probably say that I'm perhaps one of the few non-experts um, on, on hands here in this room, so I really have learned a great deal of, of physics and kind of seen also how broad this whole field is, even though polar ions are around um, for quite some time. And then just one final thing again, I think Hussein or, or Michael said this um, on Monday, so, so this, this workshop here is, is, is really like an effort of like us and, and Hussein, or us and all who say here at the item, to sort of establish some, um, some collaboration between um, Aarhus, or, or yeah, our institute and, and ITEM. So this is the second um, workshop in the series. I think some of you were actually already at the first one, so certainly Joanna, I think, and Alex had already left. So this took place last year at um, Aarhus University, and I think this was really a great start on the ITEM side, and I really hope that we can like, keep up with and turn this into a longer term series and also hope like to see you perhaps at some point again at one of these workshops. So with that, like, really thanks a lot for coming. Have a great lunch and a nice couple. Thank you.
I know Reiner and Blood and Zoe Fee even. I'm not sure if you have a correction that's good. That can be good. And also, now people from UCLA, I'm going to be able to try to find a treatment for other reasons. I don't know what they're doing. That's also my best thing. Well, it didn't kill you. So, yeah, yeah, Ich 